Thanks very much for coming. Welcome to Callis Town Meeting 2024. I'm Gus Selig. Article 1 is to elect a moderator, and for that I'm going to turn the podium over to our town clerk, Tegan, to conduct that election. Good morning. Uh, would anyone like to make any, what is the word I'm looking for? Motion. motion. Would anyone like to make a motion to elect a candidate for a moderator? Anne. I would move Gus Selig to moderator. Gus Selig has been moved as town moderator. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, I have Mark Mahaley seconding. Um, do I have any other nominations? No, but I want to vote against that guy. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get your chance. Uh, if there are no additional nominations, uh, all in favor of Gus Selig serving as moderator for the Callis Town Meeting today, please say aye. aye. All opposed? Gus, looks like it's you. Have a good day. No, I'm not going to vote again. I'm just trying to vote again. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, article 2 is to hear and act on the reports of the town officers. And before we get into that article, I think I'd like to start with uh, a few thoughts. Um, I've been coming to town meeting for uh, since 1977. This community has been having town meetings, according to the Weston case history, since 1795. Um, and I think it's a really important thing because we are living in a country where democracy is at risk and I think practicing democracy is a great thing. So thank you all for taking the day to, to, to do that. I'm um, going to talk a bit, in a minute about how town meeting works. There are probably a few people who are here for the very first time. I know many of you are very familiar with how it works and I'll bore you through that discussion. Uh, but before we do that, um, I began last year by saying we were really rusty at town meeting because we'd had a couple of years of Australian ballot and an informational meeting through the pandemic. Um, I'm still feeling a little bit rusty. And the other thing that we did last year was to elect completely new town leadership, five new members of the select board, now a sixth. Um, we've elected a new town clerk and a new town admin and for the first time we have a town administrator and I wanted to introduce our town administrator Kari Bradley who is over here today he grew up in Callis went to school here came back to the community and we're really glad that you wanted to do this work and I don't if you want to say a word or two and do we have microphone runners here we go is he really from Callis <laughs> Hey everybody, Kari Bradley. Um, yeah, I really am from Cal, so it's show. <laughs> um, yeah, so I live on Long Meadow Hill Road and, and went to this school in E32 and uh, moved back here with my family in 2019. And uh, took this job four months ago. And so, town administrator number one, question again, what is that? What, is, what does that entail? It, it's a, a, I wear a lot of different hats. It, certainly, road commissioner is a big part of it. And uh, I, I don't drive truck, but um, oversee uh, those functions. And I don't have a road background, so I've been learning a lot. And I really want to express appreciation for the road crew, uh, Tyler and Peter and Ed and Dana and John as our new foreman. I think it's just some really important. And also, um, and just thank them uh, for all their patience and uh, support of me, and a big part of my job is to support them. Also want to thank Toby Talbot for all the help he's provided to, to me and to the town. Um, I won't delve into the details of roads right now, but I'm sure it will come up in a little bit. Uh, uh, another big part of my job is overseeing the treasury function, and I want to acknowledge Sandra Ferber, who came back out of retirement to serve one last year. She'll be retiring in just a matter of weeks. She's on vacation right now, but she's just done such an amazing job. And her systems are rock solid, and I just really enjoyed learning from her and working with her. Um, and, and then the rest of the job is really supporting the select board in all that they do. We've got a bunch of different projects uh, underway that I'm trying to contribute, and, and new things coming along all the time. And I just want to thank the board members for their 
supportive and, and thoughtful leadership, and, and we're, we're very lucky to have them. Okay, and then by way of introduction, you know, this kind of year between early frost and then smoke in the sky and from Canada from nearly a month and then flooding, it feels almost like a biblical time. Uh, but I wanted to, and just signing up to be on the select board's a big deal, but to sign up this particular year has been a lot of work, so I wanted to just thank all the select board members and starting with our chair, Ann Winchester, do you guys want to just say a word and introduce yourselves to the community? Sorry, is that better? Since, <laughs> no, I moved here in Middlesex to, to marry somebody who had a house in Dallas in the late 70s. So I've been a member of the Dallas community since then. Um, and it's been absolutely my pleasure to work with you all. In fact, I was going to do this later, but I'm just going to, for a minute, call all your attention to the back of the town report. Did you see this um, organization chair? Yeah, the mic down, some of us. <laughs> Just take a look at this town report. This is a list of all the people who make Calus government work. You see all those people in blue are the staff who are paid. The ones in the very bottom box aren't paid much. They're paid stipends. Um, the others are all volunteers. And take a look at that green box. Those are boards and commissions of um, sometimes seven, sometimes nine people. And these are all the people who make Callis work. And it's, it's I, don't, I haven't counted up how many people that is, but it's, it's been such uh, an honor to work with all these people to, uh, during the last year. So thank you for the opportunity. Hi all, I'm Jamie Morby. Uh, grew up in Maple Corner and still there. <laughs> um, I am the general manager of the Maple Corner Community Store and Grammy Bar. Um, and like Ann, probably know most of you from some part of town life, some committee or some something at the store, um, and it has been a lot of fun. When I ran for select board, I didn't really know that much of what to expect, um, but it's been a lot of fun despite the challenges we've faced over the last year, um, and yeah, thank you all. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Are we good? Okay. <laughs> Anne Tulin, I'm actually uh, was raised in Montpelier. I don't know if that makes me a flatlander now, but um, I've been here for about eight years. Um, it's been an amazing year to get to know, I know many of you from my personal work and all the various offices, but um, getting to know the community better in the last year and I know we'll get to it later but a thank you to all of you and so many of you I know jumped right in um, with all of our challenges in the last year and, and we're ready to do anything that was needed so I think you all should get a round of applause for yourselves <laughs> um, we'll get to that later today. Hi all, I'm Jordan Keyes. Uh, like Anne, I had the privilege of marrying into uh, the Callis community, a uh, wonderful family in Maple Corner, but I've been an official resident of, uh, of Callis for uh, a little over two years, but, are, but around for about 10, uh, almost 11 years. Um, and over the last year, it's been a real pleasure um, serving with the, my fellow members of the select board um, and I care deeply about the issues that the, uh, that the community faces and being involved uh, and, and helping 
chart, chart a path through those kind of turbulent waters. So, Kari, you, you've already gone. So. Oh, just Donnie Mucherino was unable to come today. He is our other slide board member and he had a training because town meeting is a day off for a lot of people, but not for all people. So he was unable to be here today. Okay, so a few words about how town meeting works for those of you who are new to this or just rusty like me. Uh, today, you are a legislative body. The select board is up here to be accountable to you, um, but they don't necessarily, and they may have some knowledge of stuff, but we are all equals. We all get one vote today. Their vote was to present this warning to you that you find in the town report from pages four to seven, which is what we'll work from. Um, I've been asked, when can you bring up various kinds of questions? Uh, and there are two times in the meeting that that can happen. One is on the article we're on now, Article 2, to hear the reports and act on the report of the various town bodies. And if you've read the town report, you know that there's budget information. There's this report from the select board. There's a great anecdotal history of the flood that Erica Heilman and Tobin Anderson prepared. Um, there's reports from the Cemetery Commission and on and on. So lots of information in the town report. You can ask questions on any of that during Article 2, or you can bring up some other thing that you think is important for the community to hear about. You can also bring up stuff that's not in the warning under other business. The difficulty with other business is we can't do anything that is binding under other business. So you can't tell the select board they need to spend money on something under other business. You can ask questions about the budget now. You can also ask questions when we come to the articles on the budget where we're spending money. So that's generally how things, how the warning works and how we will work today. Um, in order to move an article, I'll, in order to act on an article, I'll need a motion and a second, and then we're open for debate. And I'll go back and forth as best I can across the room uh, to call on people. Once you've spoken, you're likely to have to wait quite a while if other people want to speak before I recognize you a second time. And if you're really passionate and want to speak to an issue a third time, um, just wait a little bit and see if somebody else might make your point for you. Uh, in Montpelier at the State House, you actually have to get special permission to talk to an issue for a third time. Uh, so we want to make sure everybody has a chance to speak. The meeting is being live streamed, but there isn't going to be external participation unless somebody uses the chat feature and then a question will be relayed to me that I'll ask. Uh, but people who are on the live stream cannot vote. In order to vote, you have to show up here. You have to sign in. And um, to speak to voting during this process, there's three ways to vote. You can vote by voice calling the ayes and nays. Somebody can request a division of the House, and then we'll count. The Board of Civil Authority will help me count the votes, and in order to vote at that point, you need one of these things that shows that you are a registered voter. So if you haven't gotten one yet, at some point you should head out there and get your card. Um, we can also have a paper ballot if there's a really divisive issue. And anybody can request a paper ballot, but six others of you need to agree that we're going to have to vote by paper ballot. Um, those are under Robert's Rules of Order, which is how we conduct this meeting as I best interpret them. I've often find, found that we make mistakes when we go too fast. Uh, one of my jobs before we take a final vote is to reread the resolution. And I will reread re the article so that you know exactly what you're voting on. Um, if you're confused about what you're voting on, you can ask for a point of information or ask for a point of order if you think things are out of work. If you think I've made a mistake, you can ask me to reconsider what I'm doing, or you can challenge the ruling of a moderator. And if a majority of you think I've made a mistake, that's the way it'll be. And I will do my best not to take that personally because um, I know I've made mistakes. Um, it is requested uh, under Robert's rules that you address the moderator and not each other. 
Um, we're a little bit loose about that, but the idea is really to depersonalize the debate by having questions go to the moderate. We are to be civil. You're not allowed, and I'll rule you out of order. I don't have a gavel today, so I may have to pound my shoe, but if you start calling somebody a liar or a cheat, you're going to be ruled out of order, and the microphone will be taken away from you. I know some of you think you've got really loud voices and you don't need a microphone. Some of us are old and we don't hear as well as we did 10 or 15 years ago. So please wait for the microphone, no matter how loud you think your voice is. We'll get it to you. You'll get your chance to speak. Um, an article can be amended. Anybody can propose an amendment. We'll then debate the amendment. Um, there can be an amendment to an amendment, but you can't go further than that. We'll try to, and we'll just work our way back that way. Um, I will, from time to time, if I think the question's gone on, the debate's gone on for a long time, and people are repeating arguments that have already been made, I may say, are you ready for the question? Um, oh, now I've got a moderate. Uh, a mallet, I won't have to use my shoe. Thank you. Um, be careful. Um, uh, let's see, I lost my thought here. Um, it, when we want, if you think debate's gone on too long, you can call the question. It takes two-thirds to call the question to say we're, we're ready to stop debate and move on. So if two-thirds of us are not ready to stop debate, we're going to keep discussing an issue. Um, let's see, the select board will have answers to questions, but sometimes select board members, people will state something in the form of a question, but they're really just making a point and not every question is yours to immediately answer, and you, like everybody else, need to be recognized by the moderator. But again, we'll be a little bit loose about that because sometimes it's very clear somebody's asking a question and one of you may have the answer that somebody um, is asking for. I think that covers the rules. So we are open for discussion of Article 2, which is on the town reports. And Karen Lane, you get the first question as soon as somebody delivers you a microphone. Hello? Um, not a question, just a motion to uh, spread praise and appreciation to the East Callis Community Trust and our um, profound appreciation for the rebirth of the East Callis General Store and its wonderful general manager, Jess Quinn. Many, many thanks. We're so glad to have our store back. Okay, and Jess, uh, as somebody who lived next to the store for 30-some years, I know it's a seven-day-a-week thing, so thank you for being here today, and thank you for being there every day. It's much appreciated. Other, okay, we have a, Barry? Yeah. And please identify yourself. How's that? Okay. Uh, my name's Barry Bernstein. Um, I live in East Calais. Glasses off so I can ask you. Um, and I've been here 53 years, and uh, I just want to say, uh, first of all, I want to say thanks for the town report. It's been it's really great, and thanks to everybody uh, who's participated. So any comments I make today are more questions and thoughts as opposed to any criticism of anybody for, because you've all done a lot of hard work. Um, roads, I wrote in the, these are the worst road conditions I've ever seen. And I think we have to thank Mother Nature for that. Because um, I know the road crew really works hard. And, uh, but I've been having trouble getting off my road several times. I can't, I'm not quite sure if we're the fourth or fifth mud season, but it, it feels like continual. I couldn't even almost get up, get uh, here from across the road. So my question for the select board, more for thought, and maybe they can, as I read through the select board, uh, the road highway budget, I'm, I'm concerned we don't have enough in there for materials. Um, we, we're not going to be able to do the roads the way we've done the last 50 years. There's just no way, way it can continue. 
And you know, it's I'm glad to see we've got a grader in there. It's a lot of money, but it, you know, we really we comments I've heard from old timers as long as I've been here. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, has been we we have a tendency not to grade uh, deep enough to really get to the uh, potholes. But aside from that, I think we're going to really have to rethink how we do it in terms of gravel and what we put in. I know they put some gravel up this year on my road, which is Bliss Road, on the last house before for Woodbury. Um, so I, I'm sure you've been talking about it, and I'm sure you've been thinking about it, but I, when I saw that we, we have the same amounts for gravel and uh, other material, I, if we're going to pass a budget, I want to know at least that you've got enough room to do more, because it's going to be essential. So that's kind of a question of, do we amend the budget uh, and give you more leeway for materials? Uh, what's your thoughts on it? Ann. Okay, Ann. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> um, so with the roads we did, because the budget was a very deliberative process um, in trying to minimize increases on folks. Last year, we were unable to tap into state funding that we get every year to fix certain sections of the road. So this year, we have two portions, which, okay, which um, off the top of my head, I'm not, not good with numbers, but I want to say it's like $153,000. Um, and I met with the guys yesterday like this? Okay. I feel like I'm eating. It's <laughs> okay. Um, we're all sharing it. Feels very, mm. um, <laughs> so with the roads, we do have to retool post-flood. Um, how we do the roads, we can kind of use the same practices that we have in the past. So we are already starting that process of looking at specific, and I know there's a section on Bliss Road East Hill where it kind of culminates there, um, where we will be working on smaller sections but doing them more deeply. So we've got roads that are flanked up by swampy stuff on both sides that need to be done a certain way. Um, and so the goal is to do fewer sections of road but do them right and then the next year do fewer sections of road but do them right and things that are going to be more resilient moving forward uh, because after having to replace some of the roads this past summer we don't want to have to do it again we're hoping that the vast majority of roads that we had to do massive repairs on will hold up in future events because we tried to be very deliberate in how we put them back together um, so we're hopeful to maximize that repayment from the state this year and then we visit it again for next year's budget. Does that answer your question? Well, I, my only thing was in terms of, do you need more, do you have enough in your material? I'm really concerned, it's not just East Dallas, it's, it's all, it's not just Bliss Road. I mean, it's, it's every road in <laughs> No, it's every road in, in town, but there's also, you know, the, the number of people we have to do the work. And, yeah, we'll talk about it, but so the materials, it's, it's not a padded budget by any stretch, but I think our goal was this year to tap in that 150 or so thousand dollars from the state reimbursement uh, to maximize what roads we could get fixed to get fixed really well. Okay, so the 150. Barry, you don't have a microphone. Oh. People deaf who can't hear you. So yeah, so this is state funding. So they so they can match. We put in a little bit, and they give us most of it. So those, for this summer were the roads that we were going to be focusing on what we're doing kind of our usual going through the whole thing in part um, to kind of shift and have a practice of really doing smaller sections really well, which is challenging because then the people that aren't on those sections are like, what about my section, what about, you know, and we have over 70 miles of roads. So it's, it's going to take a while to get there, but, but we're going to do that this year um, with hopes of softening what, you know, the raises in both the budget and other things that people are facing. But we're gonna try to do good by the roads, yes. Okay, anything else? 
anybody, anything anybody wants to raise. Um, Mac, I'm right for the microphone, please. Hi, uh, Matt Gardner Morse uh, from County Road in Dallas. Um, I noticed on page 55 that our legal fees last year were $112,000. And I, I just was concerned that, you know, don't we have legal liability insurance or something to help cover big legal expenses? Thank you. <laughs> so glad I have the privilege of talking to this one. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'm going to be a, a little a, as um, transparent as I can in answering that, uh, considering the ongoing uh, litigation issues that we have. Um, the reality is that we are living in a more litigious world, and um, so we we uh, exceeded far exceeded any budget, any normal budget that that we had been kind of earmarking. So this year we tried to take a more responsible approach uh, to making sure that we have something in there to address um, upcoming uh, legal expenses. Um, but the reality of our ongoing situation um, is that we are in kind of an awkward gap of coverage um, because um, neither party are are, are seeking um, are seeking damages, um, and uh, that isn't necessarily covered by our litigation insurance. Um, we're just kind of arguing about who's right, um, and and so in some ways. That seems like a pretty reasonable argument to have. Um, ironically, that puts us outside of our coverage for that. Um, we are exploring uh, making some changes um, to our coverage uh, to try to help uh, avoid that situation in the, in the future. Uh, but that that's that's where we stand on, on that particular issue. If I go too much further into that, I'd probably our attorneys would probably slap my hands. But. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have a hand up over there. Hi, um, uh, Linda Sheets, and I wanted to thank everyone. Last year you gave um, $4,000 for a handrail at Curtis Pond, you remember that? It went like a half hour debate on it. Well, it is done. It is at Curtis Pond now. John McCullough was the architect. Um, Josh Badalabi from High Park built it, and I had a wonderful team. Uh, Jamie was the liaison. I had Heidi um, Thompson and Meg Dotson and um, Rini Dagas all worked with me, and we and you must go down and see it. It's got little frogs that sit there looking over the pond, and we really hope it helps older people, young people of all kinds, so thank you very much. Um, yep. Can. It's on. It's on. Okay. Dan Olson here on behalf of the Planning Commission. Um, we have two vacancies uh, on the Planning Commission, and I'd like to encourage people to um, check in on the Planning Commission. Um, we're kind of rotating and getting a lot of new people and it's an exciting time. So um, look us up, or look them up, I've got to learn to say that, uh, and um, uh, it, you know, it join the crew. Now, the second thing we want to talk about on the Planning Commission is we're getting ready to rewrite the town plan. And we really can't do it in a vacuum. And so we're asking all of you to think, while we're making these decisions in 2025, what do you want in Calais in 2035. And as you think about it, on our we have a display on the back. Melanie and Jared are going to be at the table. We have a list of all of the things that have to interrelate with each other as the town plan is being um, made. Um, and we want you all to put on that board what's the most important thing and priority you think should be in the plan as we move to 2035. And I want to encourage our young people that are here, anybody, even if you're 12 years old or whatever, because in 10 years, you're gonna be 22. So 
let's get the young people to also talk about what they want in this town in 2035. So I encourage you to afterwards meet with Melanie and Jerry and contribute. And you can even go to all of the planning commission meetings and contribute that way. Thank you. Oh, one other thing before I forget. There's a map um, in our section which has uh, the conserved land, it has all of the land there, and there's white, little white things. That is what's called the development, the developable land. That's where we can develop. Now, at the same time, Larry Bush in conservation is using the same map, and he's gonna wanna talk about it because that's gonna be where are the conserved lands. And so we have to work together in doing that. So look it over, see you later. <laughs> Jan, thanks for your many, many years of service. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, that was a pivot. I don't know if Larry is here, but he'd requested some time to talk about the work of the Conservation Commission. There you are. So, Hi. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Larry Bush. I apologize for the raspy voice. Um, for the last year, I've been the chair of the Conservation Commission. I've been on it for about eight now. I wanted to take a couple of minutes to tell you about two of the things that we're proposing to, to deal with this year unless circumstances come along with something that we have to take care of, which happens all too often, I sound. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk to you group, this group in particular, is because we're going to be doing uh, public outreach efforts on two subjects. The first uh, is uh, exotic invasive species. Uh, the Conservation Commission and the Lakes and Streams Committee last year did a project that you can read about in our report uh, to um, cut back some of the Phragmites, which is a wetland uh, invasive species. Uh, we learned a lot from that experiment. The main thing we learned probably is that this is not something that we can deal with. It's going to require uh, public input, landowner input, uh, and it's a complicated and, and extremely difficult subject, but we're going to try to do uh, two things, and I'll just mention one of them here because it involves the public. Uh, we're at the beginning stages of organizing some on-the-ground walks, uh, interpretive walks, um, throughout the course of the growing season so that people can encounter as many invasive species as we can find in a compact plot and learn about what they are, what their lifespan is, and what's the best way to eradicate or beat them back. So I encourage you to look forward to that. Um, and if you have any questions between now and then, don't hesitate to get in touch with me on, uh, on the town website. The second thing I wanted to mention uh, is um, concerns that conservation easements to which uh, Jan alluded. Um, I don't know how many of you follow closely what the state's been doing in terms of environmental and forest work lately. Uh, but they passed some truly mind-blowing statutes um, which, uh, for the most part, have yet to be implemented. In particular, Act 59, which was passed last year, sets a state goal of uh, having 30% of the land in the state subject to conservation easements by 2030. Um, for that to work, and the, the details of it are being worked out by the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board in conjunction with the Agency of Natural Resources. And the final plan that, this, that the statute requires isn't going to be due from them until uh, December of uh, 2025. So this is a process that's playing out. But what we do know is that we need to find ways to encourage and help people who have forest land and also agricultural land uh, to consider and hopefully decide to put their land in conservation easements that are sponsored and held by groups like the Vermont Land Trust uh, so that this land will not only be forest land today, it will be forest land in perpetuity. And so uh, this is something, again, we're hoping to have some public sessions on and look forward to your uh, interest, hopefully, and participation in that. Thank you, guys. Okay. David Healy. I'm David Healy, the town's delegate to CB Fiber. And I just want to let everybody know, 65% of the town now has high-speed internet. And if you haven't subscribed or signed up, please do. The remaining of the town is going to be a little tough to do without money. And we're hoping to get uh, 
some of the federal broadband infrastructure money that won't be available until next year. So there may be a, a slight delay this year in finishing the rest of our district, but I just want to say this is huge progress for this town. Thank you. Got a hand up and back. Steve Chase from South County Road, Southwest Palace. There is a Southwest Palace, not many of you know about it. It's mostly under mud. I had to follow up on that horse's uh, question on the budget. It's page uh, 59 on the dog expenses in CVHS. It went up $20,000. And is that related to the legal fees? Um, and one other question about the budget that went way over in actual expenses is the general office contracts. Neemer, Cot. It went up from $8,400 to $95,000. Can anybody address that? Sorry. Right. Do the legal one first? Yeah. Please. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so the answer, I guess, related to the the dog issue, no, um, that was not. But what I failed to mention about the legal expenses that were somewhat unique last year um, were the labor negotiations that the town uh, was going through for uh, for the road crew. So um, that was a successful and long overdue negotiation to wrap up. It just happened to come out of confluence um, with some other legal expenses. But uh, I, I can't speak to the, to the dog one specifically. I was going to speak to the Nemeric contract and, you know, so amongst all the changes that have happened over the last couple of years, um, Sandra Ferber left as treasurer in, in fiscal 23 and uh, Nemeric, which is our sort of association of financial services for Vermont municipalities, actually throughout New England, <coughs> um, provided treasury services basically for that year and they, you know, they cost more than doing it in-house. Sandra came back this year as an independent contractor. Um, and so with this next year, we will fully bring the, the Treasury Service in-house and we'll start to look more like a normal um, uh, line, on the, line item on our budget. Does anybody know about that? Uh, yeah, so um, the <laughs> it, it is uh, animal boarding related. Um, so it's it's not dog specifically, but it, it's part of the other kind of litigation issue that, that, that is ongoing. At this point, it's about, uh, well, we're probably approaching two years, um, a year and a half maybe, of dealing, dealing with this particular issue. So, yes. Correct. Okay, we have a hand up in the middle, Mary Alice. Profit, and I live on Jack Hill Road. And I just wanted to point out that our um, booklet that we received in the mail has a new item in it, and it caught my eye, and I was really excited to see it. And it was the statement of inclusion, the declaration of inclusion, that we in Calus are a welcoming community. And I know as someone who is, I was born and raised in the South, we're still working on using language to articulate our values. Callus is a warm and welcoming place, and we all know that just from living here. I moved here a decade ago. My neighbors are incredible. Everybody's been so kind to me. But to see that written so that people who might be thinking about moving in to help with, with the many jobs that we need to fill in our area, to help with caretaking jobs for our elders as we try to age at home in place, I think that that statement is so important. Because what it does is it sends a signal out to people who might be willing to come to Vermont to help us in our time of need, as we're one of the oldest states in America, that we welcome you, we want you to be here, and we appreciate your help. So I was just very proud of our select board and whoever was involved in um, making that statement, just articulating the values we already have, putting them in writing. And I just want to say how much I, um, I think that's a great idea. So thank 
Okay. Yeah, my turn. Is the microphone here? Is this going to work? Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm here to talk about the Friends of Callus. So, <laughs> my name is Anna Matheson. Um, I'm the president of the Friends of Callus, along with Carrie Stoner, Renee Gronkowski, and Brooke Rimmers. Um, we lead the organization along with the community members who attend our meetings. Um, we are excited to be hosting the town lunch this year. Um, and we thank everyone who donated food and drinks and who are volunteering their time to make the lunch a huge success. So we hope you will stay and join us for lunch today. It's $5 a person. Um, kids under the age of 12 are free. Um, I also wanted to thank especially Carrie Stoner and Barbara Butler, who did the majority of the planning and organizing for the lunch this year. So they definitely deserve a round of applause from all of us. For all of you here. I also want to bring your attention to our town meeting bingo cards this year that we placed on everybody's seat. This is just a fun, interactive, individual game just to participate in town meeting um, in a different way than we've done in the past. Um, and I want to thank Renee specifically for creating the bingo cards and picking them out for everyone. So um, have fun with it. No pressure. Um, I wanted to share a little bit of background about the Friends of Callis. Um, the Friends of Callis was previously known as the PTNO, um, and it established in 2020 with the aim of expanding the scope of enrichment activities um, and better serve the broader community of Callis, and that's all of you. Um, last fall, we developed a survey that we shared, and of 107 uh, community members responded to that survey, and we have been working very diligently to use the results of that survey to help guide the programs and events that we've been planning here um, for the community. And so I want to highlight a few. Um, we started Fiber Friends, which is a gathering of folks who want to socialize by doing fiber arts. They meet at the town hall on the first and third Thursdays from 6 to 8, and the second and fourth Sundays from 1 to 3. So if you're interested in fiber arts and want to gather and socialize, that's an opportunity. Uh, we also are starting a monthly Curious Callous Nature Walk. Uh, the first one was in the Chickering Bog in February. Uh, the next one is taking place um, this coming Saturday, March 9th at 9 a.m on the Robinson Hill Trails and Robinson Hill Road, and that's gonna be led by Rachel Pelham. But if you are interested in leading a nature walk and wanna be a part of our Curious Callous Nature Walks, please reach out to us and let us know because that is an um, event that we are hoping to have monthly. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have an upcoming spaghetti dinner, uh, which is a fundraiser for the Friends of Callous. It will be here at the Callous Elementary School next Friday evening. Um, we have raffle items, um, and we have registration forms, which look like this. Um, on the back table, the swim table, um, which I want to draw your attention to, um, there's some information in the back of the room, so some of the Friends of Callus information is back there as well. Um, we are asking that people register by this Friday, March 8th, so if you are interested in attending this spaghetti dinner, which we hope you will, Please register and you can bring the forms to myself or to Danielle in the front office of Callis Elementary. We also have uh, envelopes hanging at the uh, community forest in Callis and Maple Corner. Um, and then lastly, we would love for your participation with the Friends of Callis. Uh, we meet every, third, every second Thursday of the month at the town hall from 6.30 to 8.00. Um, we cannot continue to implement and advance our goals without more help from the community, so we hope that you will join us. And if you have any questions, all of our board members are here, so seek us out. Um, we are happy to answer questions and load more detailed information, again, at the, about the Friends of Callis at the swim table in the back of the room. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, um, Daniel. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Keeney. I'm, I guess for today, the only school board representative from Callis on the Washington Central Unified 
Union School District Board. Um, I think tomorrow I'll be joined by another. I wanted to briefly thank Kari for his long service to the school board. Uh, with us today. And also uh, a thank you to Maggie Weiss who moved out of the district and uh, who had a more brief but also very important uh, membership on the board. I wanted to mention two things. One, uh, I'm available to do my best to answer any questions people have about uh, the school budget this year. Uh, it was an incredibly difficult process. It continues to be a difficult process. And I really wish the legislature would fi fix our process such that we could predict what tax rates would be before we figure out what spending is going to have to be. Um, it's a rather reverse uh, approach to budgeting, but here we are. Um, so I'll do my best to answer any questions people have. Please find me. The other thing I wanted to mention was that um, people may be aware that there's a configuration study um, being undertaken by the district. Um, it's, a, it's a scary and exciting process. Uh, there's going to be an update at our next community forum, which incidentally is being held at Palace Elementary. Uh, that's the first Wednesday in April. I think we begin at 6 o'clock. It's uh, April 3rd. Um, so I encourage people to attend if they're interested in that process, because I think there will be an update um, that evening. Thank you. Okay, we've been on the town reports for just about an hour, but go ahead, Barry. This is very brief. I, I'm assuming that you broke out the town foreman, uh, the road foreman, just so we could see that as separate from the, the budget, just clarification. <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, thank David Healy, who has put years into uh, volunteering and helping to get the CD fiber project going, and it's, uh, uh, if, if he got paid for every hour he put in, he'd be uh, owning the whole town. So we're not going to pay you to do it, but thank you very much. And I just... And uh, I also want to say we're missing a member of the town, Betty Bush, who they had a fire up on Max Gray and she was really burned, and I know she comes every year, um, came into town about the same time I did, and I just, uh, I know we're all thinking about her, so I just wanted to mention that. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Anything else? Jamie, do you need to want to say a word about the store that you're managing? I just uh, wanted to thank everybody for their support over the last year at the Maple Corner store. We've had a really exciting year of growth. Uh, with the whammy bar shut down throughout much of COVID, uh, having been open for the last year, our uh, revenue has grown a lot, our offerings have grown a lot. Um, it's been an exciting year. We are, uh, if you come in the store regularly, you know that it's currently half walled off as we launch a new kitchen renovation. Uh, and we'll be uh, opening our new kitchen, hopefully at the end of this month, which is very exciting. Um, and yeah, it's great. And we're really excited East Callis is open now too. It's been fun working with Jess a little bit. Uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for the three stores in town to continue to work together and grow together. Okay. Thanks. So, um, I think we've now heard lots of the town reports, asked lots of questions. Are we ready to move to Article 3? Hearing no objection, Article 3 is to elect the following town officials, trustee of public funds for three-year term. I believe Scott Kronzkowski is the incumbent, uh, is the first election. Nominations are open. And your name, please? Okay. And do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any other nominations? 
And was that a nom move motion to close nominations and have the secretary cast one ballot for Scott? You're the maker of the motion, so I'm just trying to, we can close, not have a separate vote on closing nominations. But, yes, I'm in favor. You're in okay, we're going to, so we have, and are you seconding it? Okay, so the motion has been made both to nominate Scott Granskowski and to close nominations and have the secretary cast one ballot. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, congratulations. Now we need to elect the cemetery commissioner, um, and I believe Michael Ford is the incumbent. Nominations are open. Okay, we have a second. And is that a nomination? And do we have any other nominations? Michael Ford has been nominated and seconded. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none. All those in favor of re-electing Michael to the Cemetery Commission, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, Michael, thank you for doing that again. We are up to Article 4, which reads, Shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $1,693,548, of which $1,367,000, $1,718 shall be raised by taxes and $325,830 by non-tax revenue. Does somebody from the select board want to move that? And Winchester has moved it. Do we have a second? It's been seconded. Discussion? Yeah, get a microphone back. I'm Craig Lane. I live on Old West Church Road. Um, obviously, the dirt roads are paramount importance. But I notice uh, driving the county road any time I go to town that it's breaking up to a significant degree. I don't believe the cracks were sealed last summer. Um, it's something that really only would have taken a phone call. But I'm wondering you know, what the plan is because I know. Uh, we resurfaced sections of it a mile at a time, what, 10 years ago? More than that? I, I'm not sure. Um, but as it really breaks up now, the freezing and thawing, I wonder what's the plan for the county road? Thanks. So you, you are correct that um, the um, general approach is to pave or resurface one mile at a time. That's because the, I think it's the Better Roads grant that's provided by the state um, basically covers one mile of value. So um, Toby Talbot is our uh, grant administrator and we're gonna make a determination within the next few weeks of whether to apply for that grant this year to take care of the oldest section, which would be the southernmost, the first mile coming out of East Montpelier, which I think is probably in the worst shape. Um, so certainly um, that's going to be a sort of a top of list, whether to, to take that on this year or seal, patch, and, and try to get through one more year. Thank you. Yes, we've got a hand up in the back. Wait for the microphone, please. It's right in front of you. I appreciate repaving there. It's right in front of my house, the west section. And if I turn left to go to Montpelier, I miss it. But if I go to Maple Corner Store to refill my beer supply, I hit it every time. Okay, and I think there's a hand right behind you. I just had a couple of questions on, on the budget figures. I noticed in the proposed budget for a Treasurer, it's blank. Uh, can you explain what that's about? Yep, I can take that one. So um, it became pretty clear when we started the budgeting process that we needed to really rethink the staffing model. And so the approach that um, we're planning for is that I will be appointed the treasurer and then we will hire an assistant treasurer to help with the um, bookkeeping, you know, accounts payable and payroll. 
as I'm learning those systems now, well, that'll help inform how many hours a week, you know, what, what, how much skill um, do we need for that position? Um, but we've, we've accounted for that model within this budget. And my second question was, um, looking at the general hire expenses, uh, it would be really helpful to me. I, I think the road crew is doing an amazing job. I have no idea how many people are on the road crew right now and what the structure is of who supervises it. I mean, is there a road foreman or is Toby the road foreman? And there's some explanation of where we are compared to where we were a year ago would be really helpful. Sure. So yeah, we, um, we have five members of the road crew currently. Three are full-time and then two are part-time. The budget has in it um, room for five full-time. Um, however, the two, the two part-time works pretty well for us. We have two um, people that came out of retirement to help, um, and uh, that has worked really well because um, they, can, they can fill in when we need all five, um, a certain amount of flex in the schedule. Uh, and so the structure is, um, I'm the road commissioner, oversee that. We have um, John Stafford is our road foreman who works on the crew and then the, the rest of the individuals are, are part of the road crew. Further discussion and questions in front, Mac. Hi, I noticed there was quite a bit of ARPA money and I was wondering what the plan is for the ARPA money. Do it? Yeah, virtually all of the ARPA funds, which was a total of 480,000, uh, somewhere in, in that neighborhood. So ARPA is American Rescue Plan Act, which is money that was provided by the federal government to municipalities. Calus's allocation was somewhere in the neighborhood of 480,000. Virtually all of that has been obligated at this point, either spent or um, uh, turned over to whoever whoever the beneficiary of that's going to be. I think the single largest allocation was 200,000 for, for the... Sorry, CB Fiber. It was CB Fiber, thank you. Um, the dam got a portion, um, East uh, Callis uh, Water District? Fire District received a large portion. Um, uh, you know, there's there's probably a dozen different beneficiaries and, and essentially all of that money has been spoken for at this point. Um, I had a, a, a several questions, I don't know, but I'll just kind of uh, try to go through them, but not in order. But one I noticed is that our delinquent tax uh, amount has gone up to $7,000 compared to just a few hundred last year. You know, I'm concerned about um, the people that have the hardest time with taxes um, having to pay additional. So I just, that's just more of a, a comment. Um, I see that um, we're spending about $17,000 for the town hall, um, but the upstairs, is, after spending a lot of money, including town money, is still um, not insulated. We're talking about having to expand our town clerk's office. Um, we spent a lot of money on buildings, and I, I know that you are all very thoughtful about it, but I think um, as much as the desire to make the uh, town hall upstairs into a community space, I think we have to weigh that into to our need for the town clerk's office. Um, you know, I trust the judgment of everybody. I know I already spent a lot of time on it, wanting to make it to community development, but we've, uh, it's just a, a, another thought question. Um, I'd have to refer to my notes. There's a couple other things, but I'll see if anybody else has anything to say before I go on. Okay. I'll take red mic. <clears throat> Hi, Artie Toulos. Uh, Barry, um, there is uh, funds that we got from donations for the upstairs at the town hall. We were waiting to see. There was a couple of other grants that were a possibility um, that we had the possibility of getting, so we kind of held off doing the upstairs work to see if we could get some of these grants and they didn't all come through. So now we're at this spring and summer, you'll see some action upstairs at the town hall. 
we are planning on putting in the lights and sound up there and being more active. It was just kind of holding off with these other grants because we didn't want to do work that we would have to undo if we were going to try to either insulate or add some heating or things up there. So we wanted to kind of hold off to see what funds we had. So we do have some funds that we got anonymously and some other ones. So we will see um, hopefully this spring and summer some uh, additional work being up there to set that up as a real active community space and um, for plays and sound, uh, lights, uh, sorry, uh, theater and, and music and things like that. So that work, it seems to have been on hold for a little while, but you will see forward motion on that soon. We have a hand in the middle, Erica. Good to the side. Just to, to follow up with what you were saying, Barry, about delinquent taxes, um, every year we come and every year pe people say that they don't know how they're going to pay their taxes this year. They don't know how they're going to pay their fuel bill this year. And um, we are all empathetic, but I don't know what we're actually doing about it. And when we talk about the town plan and um, wanting to to in be inviting of new people coming here, I think it behooves us to ask, how are we gonna help people stay here who have been here and wanna stay here? And I, I don't know what the practical question is. I know that I'm late to this question and maybe it's something for next year that the select board could look at, but I, I was talking with Gus about it there. Before land use, there was, um, we sort of dealt with, we, we helped farmers on a local level before there was the state uh, land use policy, and I'm wondering if there's some way that, uh, you know, those of us who are not particularly worried about the tax bill or too squeezed by it, is there a, can we be kicking in a hundred bucks to help cover these, these, um, these costs? I don't know how that works. I'm just thinking we really need to be personal about how are we going to help people stay here. Okay, we have a hand up in the middle on this side. Hi, I'm Mercedes Pignon. I live um, right on um, Jack Hill Road. I've been living here for over 10 years, and I appreciate everybody. I love town meeting day, by the way. <laughs> um, so I agree with you, and by looking at everything here in the budget, there are needs and there are things that are wants, and everybody's aware of that. I'm going to touch on a very sensitive topic, but hear me out. Uh, <laughs> so, the, I know there's inflation. Everything, every, everything just keeps going up and up, including taxes. So, we're going to have to draw the line and try to see, to differentiate what are the needs versus the wants. Like, for example, um, to be honest, the Kellogg Hubbard Library it's now, uh, the proposed budget keeps going up, like now it's $33,220. I understand a lot of people attend and go and it's beautiful and all, but one of the things that I learned when I moved here is the library's not in Calus. Um, Point of order. Yes? Does it just pertain to, a, to be discussed article? There is, there is a special article on this topic, right. I'm going to let her make her point. It, it's just an example. It's just So if we can, I'm not saying just stop everything, but if we look at just little things here and there that we could still support, but take care of our own first, and then see what, what's there left that maybe we can, you know, spare. Let's put it that way. But let's consider when other articles like this come up. What is a want versus a need? Because over a million dollars uh, over, it, it's just a little too much. So taxes, the way they keep going up, is not helping that situation either. And it's not helping anybody, so thank you. Okay, there's another hand in the grandstand there. Hi, Pam DeAndrea, um, Duke of Brook Road. I know this isn't a lot of money, and this is just a quick question, but page, uh, page 59, um, 
Under Planning Commission, Jan, maybe you can answer this, um, is an interactive map program, CAI Technologies. I'm wondering what CAI is going to do for the town and how that differs from the interactive map that we already have. What more are you getting? I know it's not a lot, but still, it's 3,000 bucks. Uh, Jan, you have a hand up. Hi, Jan. Are you in a better position to speak to it, or you want me to kind of? Uh, if you want to, you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that is a um, potentially a, a replacement to the interactive uh, maps that with, that we have, uh, and is a resource that is uh, a lot more flexible and something that we can utilize to make. Uh, managing and tracking uh, documentation a lot more efficient. Um, what has become increasingly clear, certainly to the members of uh, this select board, uh, who've gotten way into the weeds and, and worked very closely with, with a lot of the different commissions, is there's a lot of different um, groups within the community um, who could really benefit from a centralized resource like that. Um, and, and gain a lot of efficiency in their work to having a resource like that and making it more accessible and transparent for the rest of the community. Um, so that is why we're exploring, uh, exploring funding that particular resource. Uh, there is going to be a period of overlap for sure uh, in, in functionality, uh, but it's, it's a more robust piece of equipment. Jan, is that accurate? <laughs> Sounds like close enough. Close enough. We have a hand up in the grandstand. Yeah. I just have one other question. Um, there's a kind of a giant uh, elephant in the budget um, for next year, it looks like, and I wanted to know what the status was of the one point, I guess it was seven million that was spent on the road repairs as of due to the flood. And you mentioned that in the selectman's report, select board report, I should say, that uh, there were hopes that that FEMA reimbursement might happen in the spring. Uh, and I'm curious where that's at and, and what the chances are that most of that money will come in. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so the figure is approximately 1.5 million was our total expense for flood related repair. and. Um, that includes the time um, that our road crew spent on it and the use of our equipment, but also materials and contractor work. And uh, Toby Talbot and Scott and Charlotte Passage have really led that effort of just really um, detailed work of compiling all that information and submitting it in the form that FEMA wants it. Uh, and they've been, been doing this since the, since the last summer. And uh, we have now been approved for the very first distribution, first reimbursement, um, including the, the state will actually uh, cut the check. So we had to go through a, a process of, of being approved by the state. And we should be seeing that first reimbursement um, any time now. Uh, the, the amounts are still in, in, um, in flux because um, the, the legislature is, is basically working on that. And, so, but what we've been expecting is 75% uh, reimbursement by FEMA and another 12.5% from the state. Um, so, uh, it's, it's hard to say what the timing on, on the full amount is going to be because there are multiple layers of review for each reimbursement um, from FEMA um, and then various divisions of FEMA having to do with environmental, historical, uh, and so on. And so, um, Hopefully that will all come forth in the, in the coming months, uh, but we are expecting a cash flow crunch because all that 1.5 million had to be paid. Um, and so that de has basically depleted our reserves. We're down to about 400,000 in the checking account with a, with a $200,000 um, tax, tax bill to the school district coming. Um, so we're looking at our um, cash flow options, line of credit and so on. And, Navigating that, it's going to be interesting the next few months, but we're going to be okay. Is the I'm going to hand up here, and then we'll go to. Uh, Hi, Mark Mahali. Um, I guess I'm speaking in my 
as, as your representative on this issue, first of all, I think this town was more successful than most in really pushing through the FEMA applications. The FEMA process is bureaucratic and difficult, and Toby Talbot and Scott and Charlotte Bassett and our town really did a great job. So I just believe me, there are towns out there that really couldn't get it together, and it's really sad. But at any rate, there is a local, as Kari said, there's a local share, which it varies, but let's just say grossly 5%. And on Friday, the state, the, the House and the Senate passed uh, an act which went to the governor, and I think he'll sign it because it had a lot of Republican as well as democratic support, which reimburses towns for most of their 5%. And so um, we'll get a grant right away. Uh, I think it's, Anne, I gave, how much? 30? 30, if I'm looking at Yeah, 30,000. We'll get a grant of 30,000 right away, we don't, and then the rest will come as the FEMA process drives along. But we are going to be almost entirely reimbursed. Excuse me. Yep. Uh, Donna Finch, I'd like to follow up on Artie's comments about the town hall. And the friends of the Callis Town Hall are doing a lot of the work upstairs, and that is not coming out of tax dollars, it's coming out of fundraising. And I believe in the budget there's $6,000 for a reserve fund, which I think we're voting on today. Okay, uh, we have a hand in the middle, and I'll just say our article is Article 4, and we'll see if we're ready to vote on it soon. Hey there, uh, Tobin Anderson. Um, I'm in the anomalous position of being someone who lives here full time, but my home is officially a second home, legally. And my recommendation to the town is actually Given the question of how we keep people who uh, are already living here, here, how do we allow people to live in their homes, I feel like you have to tax second homeowners more. I mean, I don't like it, but screw me, you know? And there are all sorts of reasons to do it, to retain the town's character, and most importantly, to retain people who have been living here, in some cases, for generations. So anyway, I just, that's what I recommend, is actually um, make me sad. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right, so we're on Article 4. Are you ready to hear the question? No, we have another hand. Third time, Barry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we have to call the legislature. You know me well. Um, the uh, couple of questions I didn't, three things I didn't uh, actually raise. One is I wonder if we can hear from the Curtis Crown Dam. I see in the report that we're at least $300,000 short of even getting this thing done. And, um, you know, having sw swam in Curtis Pond for over 50 years and loving it, I did read a very thoughtful letter to the other from a water biologist or whatever, an ecologist who said um, we really need to also be thinking about um, how long we, we will retain some of the ponds and some of the dams. Um, and it's, you know, it's 300,000 now, but anyway, I'd like to just hear from those folks, because it is, I, we're not putting any money in the budget, so I guess it could come, but I did raise it earlier. The other couple of question was, the $45,000 for the cemetery, is that, um, that comes out of the budget? It, it's a separate article, Barry, but okay. it'll, that's Article 5. Oh, okay. And yes, we'll, we'll all have to pay for it, but it's not part of this article. Oh, okay. And um, the reserve fund for the town hall, is that, that keeps adding in, so it's 10000 for this year. Do we know what the balance is for for that. I mean, I'm assuming it's cumulative, but I wasn't clear. And I'll, I won't ask for fourth. <laughs> I'll speak briefly to the Curtis Pond while she looks for the other's information. 
Um, yeah, we uh, thank you all for passing the $450,000 bond last year. Uh, that was a very exciting moment. Uh, about a month ago, um, we had a budgetary shortfall of about $380,000, um, just because of delays and dramatically increased construction costs from the estimates of a year before. Uh, we've worked really hard. We've closed uh, near about half of that gap through private donations. Uh, we're working with a couple of community members um, on a contingency plan. We had a grant that we thought was going to cover some of the shortfall that not everyone knows this yet. Unfortunately, the grant did not come through, uh, and we were not funded through that. Um, but we have a path forward um, for construction this year that we'll be able to speak more about in a couple of weeks as it comes together and we start negotiating the actual contract. Um, but it is looking like we will be able to construct the dam this summer as scheduled um, without a dramatically increased cost or any budgetary increase uh, to the town. It will be through private donations. <laughs> The amount in the town hall fund at the moment is five hundred and fifty-eight dollars. Thank you. Yes, you can have it. Hi. Just a quick question. Speaking of bonds, um, and I'm sorry if I um, if it's there somewhere and I missed it. Is the beavers problem going to be resolved as part of, <laughs> as part of the project? Um, I don't know if you noticed, but they're destroying everything. And, and I know we've been through um, some um, grants. Like there was like a few years ago reconstruction, and they did something about that issue. But just making sure it doesn't get ruined again after all that. Um, effort and money and work that goes into it. Thank you. So I guess what I'll say to that is, uh, having lived here my whole life, I don't think the beaver problem will ever be resolved. <laughs> um, it is a perpetual issue. Um, the newly constructed dam will be much stronger and less susceptible to problems based on beaver activity. Um, and there will be some some aspects of the design related to that directly, uh, but beavers like to dam up water, and they'll continue to do so, uh, but with much less uh, risk to the dam, the pond, and the community when they're doing so. Okay, Jan, the microphone will get to you. It's, it's on its way. Very briefly, um, I took the $1,367,718 for our budget, divided it by 1,607 people. I have this calculator. It's $815 per person. I'm kind of a, a numeric nerd sometimes, um, but it just was an interesting fact. And with that, I moved to close. <laughs> okay, we've had a motion to call the question. That's not debatable. All those in favor of ending debate, please say aye. Aye. Those who want to go on, please say nay. Okay, and the question is, we've closed the debate. The question is, shall the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $1,693,548, of which $1,367,718 shall be raised by taxes, and $325,830 by non-tax revenue. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. And the ayes have it. We're on to Article 5, which asks, shall the voters appropriate the sum of 45,000 for the operation and maintenance of cemeteries? Would somebody like to move that article? Michael's moved it. Do we have a second? It's been seconded. We're open for discussion. All 
I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm going to assume we're ready for the question. All those in favor of Article 5, shall the voters, which asks us to appropriate 45000 for the operation and maintenance of the cemeteries, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And we've passed Article 5. Article 6, shall the voters appropriate $33,220 for library services provided through the Kellogg Hubbard Library? Would somebody like to move this article? Yeah. It's been moved. Do we have a second? It's been seconded. We're open for discussion. Yeah, right in front here. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Dean. Uh, I live in Maple Corner with my family. Um, I'm also the trustee. Uh, representing Callis for the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Uh, we had a question earlier about uh, the cost of funding the library, uh, Callis's portion of it, and I just wanted to say a couple of things um, because, very briefly, because when we're asked to fund things, we naturally think of the cost, and I wanted to say something about the value. Um, we often think of public libraries functioning mainly as repositories of freely accessible books, available to be checked out by anyone with a library card. And while there's truth uh, to this, um, uh, there's truth and value to this, libraries have always been more. And in our contemporary context, uh, the circulation of physical books has been matched by other benefits. The library offers a welcoming community space. And whether you're looking for quiet or connection, warmth in the winter or cool in the summer, engaging in informative programs for young and old, use of computers and Wi-Fi, or even that rarest of commodities, a public bathroom, the library has you covered. And for those who may prefer engaging from home, either by choice or necessity, the library offers online access to e-books, audio books, streaming video, and online magazines and courses. So I hope the value of the library, including but beyond lending books, is apparent, and I'd really appreciate the support today. I also just wanted to add that you know, the, the earlier commenter mentioned that the library is not in Calais, which is obviously true, but it's accessible to all of us who live here. Hundreds of us use the library, including children, older folks, and not only people go to the library, but they get library services brought to them here in Calais. We have home deliveries for those who are homebound. We have community outreach where we bring books to community centers such as Maple Corner and Adamant uh, Co-op. And so it's not just merely uh, a place where people go in Montpelier to get books. It's lots of other things, and the library comes to us as well as us going to it. Thank you. Okay, we have a hand in the middle. I just wanted to thank my lovely and beautiful neighbor over here for raising this question. Um, one of the kindest and sweetest people on Jack Hill Road appreciate you so much. I think the spirit of your question was important because you were pulling out of an example, but you're, the point you're making is let's prioritize taking care of our community first. And I think that's a wonderful, wonderful point. And I think that the design of how we get to that is, is the point, right? It's not particularly with the library um, budget. I come from a part of the country in the rural American South where libraries are closed. And culture reflects that, the way that people think um, about history and education and telling the truth and being self-reflective um, is directly correlated with their values and their lack of funding of libraries. So I just wanna say that one of the reasons why I was so excited to raise my three children in Callis is even though we're a rural community and we value hard work and we respect people who know how to work with their hands, we also value education. And I think that the way that we fund the library every year is a symbol that our community believes that education and hard work are both equally important in civic life and in community. And so I just think that um, regardless of the amount of money we send to the Hubbard Library, our statement every year that we support it is critical in maintaining um, good culture here. And we can have good culture and also um, be uh, living in rural life. So, thank you. 
further discussion. Nick? So I was just wondering what the library is doing about the flooding in Montpelier. I mean, it's continually being a hit with floods and stuff, and I, I don't know. I think we're pour, pouring money into a sinkhole. Uh, yeah, um, the library suffered about a million and a half dollars worth of damage, but nothing in the budget that's coming from Calus or any of the other towns are paying for that damage. That is. Uh, being paid for almost entirely by FEMA grants, um, some state funds, and private donations. So that is uh, and part of what's being done to improve uh, the prospects of the library for future funding is raising the mechanicals out of the basement where they've been up to higher levels so that in future floods, which unfortunately may well happen, uh, the damage should be massively less significant to the structure and operations of the building. I'm not seeing any other hands, so I'm going to assume we're ready for the. Oh, there is a hand. So, quick question. Uh, speaking loud enough, I hope. The library stopped taking fines. Is everyone aware of that? And I don't know how much revenue they've lost accordingly. So, that's one aspect. If you're used to paying a lot of fines, you're paying more. <laughs> In your budget for not having to pay those things. <laughs> Is there further discussion? If not, uh, the question in front of us is, shall the voters appropriate $33,220 for library services provided through the Kellogg Hubbard Library? If you're in favor, please say aye. Aye. If you're opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and we have passed Article 6. Article 7, we often call the social services article. It asks, shall the voters appropriate the total sum of $30,377 to meet the amounts requested by the following organizations in the Calais and Central Vermont area, which organizations provide social services for the benefits of Calais residents, such amounts being reasonably necessary for the support thereof. And then we list, and I will not read all of them, 28 organizations uh, asking for various amounts of funding, which I think I understand to be consistent with last year's request. Is that right? Yes. Would somebody like to move this article? It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? David. Okay. Any other? Barry, let me get your microphone. I know we've been talking about money, et cetera, but having been an incorporator and running a couple of nonprofits in my past life, um, it's really hard for most of these organizations to even get, get your press money from us. Um, given all that's gone on with inflation, I would like to recommend that we, uh, I'd like to recommend or amend this to raise the amount by 5%, which is $1,518. Not a lot, but I just think we're talking about flooding. I know one of the organizations I was involved in, Vermont Center for Independent Living, the Peter Yonke is a deputy. Uh, director got flooded out. they have been out of the space for a year. I think it's just a small gesture. Um, so that's my uh, uh, amendment to this article. And that was 1500 how much? $18.5%. Do we have a second? It's been moved and seconded that we add $1,518 or 5% to article. I'm going to assume that that's the intent um, to give everybody here a 5% bump. So that's the question in front of you. We're open for discussion of the amendment. 
Um, seeing no hands, all, yes? Okay. Hi, this is Barbara McAndrew. Um, I appreciate that very much. I just would like to decline the 5% for um, Old West Church. We're at $500, and I would prefer those resources go to the Woodbury, Calus Woodbury food shelf or uh, others that are directly serving our community. So I, I appreciate the point, Mary, but I, I, I feel like the funds need to go to direct service organizations. Any further discussion of the article, of the amendment? All those in favor of amending Article 7 by adding uh, $1,518 or 5%, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. Nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it, and um, uh, we've defeated the amendment. We're back to the original article, which is to ask for $30,377 for the 28 organizations. Are you ready for that question? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And you've passed Article 7. Articles 8 and 9 um, are going to be separate, but um, they really go together in terms of establishing a reserve fund and then appropriating funds. And Mark, just to put you on deck, uh, when we get through these two, I'll ask for a legislative update from you. So Article 8, shall the voters establish a reserve fund under the control and direction of the select board to be known as the Emergency Measure Reserve Fund for the purpose of purchasing services and supplies in the event of a town emergency. Would somebody like to move this article? And he's moved it. Do we have a second? Second. It's been seconded. Discussion? Nick, uh, let's hear from our emergency management award-winning officer. <laughs> I'm Nick Emlin, and uh, this fund is for emergency spending uh, for on immediate needs in the event of an emergency event. So when the, uh, for instance, this would be for supplies or um, services for opening a shelter. Uh, it might be for an industrial pump and a flood, if we ever have that experience. And uh, it, this is typically the select board would be voting to approve something like this, but in an emergency event where there might not be power or internet and so forth, as happened a couple of Decembers ago, uh, this would allow for um, immediate uh, purchase. So, uh, the uh, yeah, so that's the purpose of the fund. I'll also address Article 9 at the same time which would uh, fund, which would put money into the, into the reserve fund, $1,000. Uh, that money would not, would uh, roll over from year to year. So if it doesn't get spent, it just sits in there until it's needed and maybe that won't be for a really long time. Uh, and while I have the microphone, uh, I would just also, a couple of, uh, I'm gonna put a plug for volunteer assistance with some of the stuff that the emergency management committee is doing. But should I do, can I do that now? I'm not going to stop you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a number of projects going on. Uh, we'd love to get your, uh, they depend on volunteer assistance. Uh, a couple of them that I want to mention. One is the shelter, uh, opening a shelter in an emergency when needed and uh, volunteers to, uh, we have a, a roster, we're developing a roster of uh, people who may be available to volunteer in that situation. Uh, is, let's see, uh, is uh, Betty Copeland, are you here, Betty? Betty, can you just stand up and wave so people can see it? Betty's uh, <laughs> working on maintaining that list and speak with Betty if uh, you would like to uh, sign up. There's no commitment, it's just we might call you and say, 
Are you available for three hours on this afternoon, or are you available to um, to help staff shelter overnight? Um, and another, uh, was, uh, on Saturday, this coming Saturday, in this building, American Red Cross is coming to conduct a uh, simulation training, bring their little van with their gear and uh, cots and blankets and, and equipment uh, to train volunteers on how to staff and operate the shelter. So if anyone's interested in participating in that, uh, please see Betty, and uh, she is also in charge of that. I'll mention one other project we have going on, which is emergency radio communication. Uh, some of you may know that uh, with grant funding, the town uh, purchased antennas. There's one antenna that's now up in, in the town hall um, bell tower, 18-foot antenna, for emergency radio communication, which uh, it can extend much farther than what we currently have in town uh, with the town group. So for instance, we can reach out to um, hospitals around the state, the Vermont State Police, the National Guard, the Vermont Emergency Management, and so forth. Uh, so it's a, it's a backup means of communication, emergency communication, when cell service and the uh, other communication services are, are down. Um, we've been holding uh, self-taught classes uh, at the town hall on Saturday mornings for uh, gaining FCC licensure to be able to use these frequency, emergency frequencies. And Jane English has been heading up that effort. Jane, would you staff, if you have any interest in becoming um, licensed to operate these radio communications, please speak with Jane. Let's see if I've got anything else here. Uh, this is the sign-up sheet. Oh, sign-up sheet in the back. And, pardon? And also on our website. Uh, oh yes, thank you. Uh, Jake just, uh, uh, Jake, would you just raise your hand? Jake is also very involved with the radio communications project, and he just put up on the town website, uh, you can put your name on the uh, roster for a potential volunteer. Uh, they're on the, on the website, he has that, that sign-up sheet. Um, and uh, let me see, uh, we have other volunteer opportunities. I'm not going to go into any more of them, but you can speak with me or any of the members of this, uh, of this committee. You'll find our names on page 39 of your town report. And um, let's see if there are any, I see some hands up. Jane, did you want to make a comment? to use radios, either commercial or ham radio, and want to be on a list that would be called in an emergency. It's not a big commitment or anything. We are going to do a few test things, going around town, checking out where, where the town radios don't work and where they do work. We're doing a lot of that kind of stuff. So if you like playing radio, let me know. <laughs> Where are the shelters? We have the primary shelter. Uh, as we had, we had a consultation uh, visit, site visit from American Red Cross, and they said, Council Elementary School is a fantastic place for shelter. So this is our primary shelter. And secondary is Town Hall, and also Maple Corner Community Center, which uh, American Red Cross said it's too small for us to get involved, but you could have your your, um, your own small local. So those are the three we have right now. We're also talking about uh, getting something going at the East Calus Community Center. On that note, I want to mention that the town has also purchased, through with grant funding, uh, antennas for, uh, in addition to the one that's now at the town hall, at the um, in, in this building, at the East Calus Community Center. At the, and the Town Garage and Maple Corner Community Center. So all of these uh, locations could be part of this network of new, uh, emergency communication, which can re reach far beyond the borders of Palace. Um, and I'll just say that our emergency management team meets on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month. We alternate between East Palace Community Center and the, the Town Hall. So everyone is welcome to join us for those meetings.
That's it for now. Any questions? Any other questions? Right yes. behind Nick. We have a, oh, something right here. Sarah. Sarah. Hi, everybody. Um, Sarah Black. I am not on the select board. I'm just doing the Zoom. Uh, so I just wanted to say real quick, this is my first town meeting, so I'm still learning how this all works. Probably should have done this during the town report part, but I wanted to say a huge, massive thank you to the entire emergency management team. I don't know if you all saw them during the floods. Um, full disclosure, Jake is my husband, so I saw them all during the floods. And they were out there in the middle of the night at the dam and driving around, and they were working tirelessly, and they have continued to work tirelessly. They spend their Saturdays every weekend doing stuff for the emergency management team. So thank you all very, very much. Okay, was there one other hand up? David Healy. I want to thank Sarah Black for putting up the emergency roads web page on the town site. Thank you. Okay, is there any further discussion of Article 8? Yeah, we have a hand there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Walter Brzezinski. I live in the Bliss Pond District. I uh, just wanted to say I think it's a great idea. Uh, more of a process question, is the intent that we create this fund and it becomes a line item on the budget every year? Uh, I imagine so, but uh, if so, the question is, what's the ideal amount that would be in this rainy day fund? Uh, it would not become a line item. It, it's, it's unused, it rolls over from year to year. And so, yes, yeah, not a line item. The Vermont Emergency Management Vermont Emergency Management recommends that a town have as much as five thousand dollars in this fund, but uh, we didn't think that was a good idea to to request that. So it's the request is for a thousand dollars. We can you can vote to create, or you already did vote to create the. No, we still have to do the voting. Okay. Right <laughs> to create the fund. Uh, and you don't have to fund it, uh, but it, it is a great idea to have the fund in place if we need it. But uh, yeah, I recommend $1,000 in the context of all the, all the conversation we've already had about needing to control the budget. Any further discussion or are you ready for the article? And the article is, shall the voters vote, establish a reserve fund under the control and direction of the select board to be known as the emergency? Measures reserve fund for the purpose of purchasing services and supplies in the event of a town emergency. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Article 8 passes. Article 9. Shall the voters approve a $1,000 appropriation to the emergency measures reserve fund? Somebody like to move that? So moved. And moved. Do we have a second? Second. And moved and seconded. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor of appropriating, approving a $1,000 appropriation to the Emergency Measures Reserve Fund, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Take a brief break to hear from our representative, Mark Mahali, about what's going on down the road in Montpelier. Again, good morning, everybody. I'm Mark Mahali. I, I want to start off by talking a little more about flood. Um, Friday, we also, the legislature also passed, and I think the governor will sign legislation that helps towns that have lost a lot of taxes because so much property was damaged. Towns like Johnson and Montpelier and Barry, they've just lost millions of dollars of tax base. So the state's trying to help them out. Aside from that, my view is that the state really this does an, in, an inadequate job of helping towns during floods. I mean, Nick and his crew did a fabulous job, but we were basically on our own. Despite assertions to the contrary, we really didn't get a lot of assistance from the state. And one of the things that I found in my work is that a lot of the state work on floods, the future flooding needs help. 
I'm worried about the future. Uh, climate change means there's going to be a lot more rain. We can't do rear view mirror planning. We have to think about the future. It's not going to look like the past. In 2011, there was enough rain that Marshfield Dam almost failed. They, we came close to having to open the floodgates. If the floodgates of Marshfield Dam were to be opened, the villages of Marshfield and, and Plainfield, as you know them, would disappear. And they would disappear within less than an hour. And there are no plans that are really good for evacuating people for emergency response. That dam safety is regulated. A lot of the dams are regulated by the Public Utilities Commission, which doesn't have any expertise in dam safety. So I've introduced two bills, and they're moving. They're moving through the Senate, and they're in the House as well, because uh, Senator Persley and I work together. And these would change the regulation so that the entity in the state that does dam safety, that has the expertise, would do the regulation, and also start a planning process so that we would decide how can the state realistically help towns in the event of future of, of future flooding. And I, I just think that what happened to us in July will happen again. It'll just happen again. So turning to something more fun, Gabrielle, Felina, are you here? She had to leave. She had to leave. Well, uh, she, she was, uh, I have a certificate which I'm going to give to the cause of her having to leave her husband, <laughs> who we fortunately hired. Would you please pass this certificate of appreciation from the Secretary of State uh, to Gabrielle? Um, I don't want to take much time. I'm on the House Appropriations Committee, which is money. Last year, we had a lot of it. And that's because we had a lot of federal money. The federal money is drying up, and so we have a very tight tight budget. And we are working on all housing, the whole housing crisis, public safety, schools. Every one of these issues is going to require really serious rethinking about how we do business. The school funding, I'm, uh, you all know it, you know it particularly. The legislature is going to take a hard look at how we do funding personally. My own view is that we ought to abolish the property tax completely and go to it and with respect to the schools and go to an income tax, which is more progressive. But I'm not sure that that's going to happen. But it's kind of that level of thinking that has to go on. Um, you know, public safety is a big issue in a lot of towns. There's sort of more retail theft, more car theft going on. And again, the issue is money. Um, the problem is, everybody kind of agrees, all the experts, that if you want, the way to reduce crime is for people to know that if they're caught, they will be punished quickly. That is, the time between being arrested and tried is quick. Well, in Vermont right now, the time between arrest and trial is two to three years. And so if we want to change that, we're going to have to fund, we're going to need more judges, more prosecutors, more defense attorneys, et cetera. Unfortunately, the current draft budget the governor sent us cuts in every one of those areas. And so I'm just illustrating this, that we're facing really difficult challenges because we're not going to increase taxes on the middle class in Vermont. We're just not going to. And so we have limited resources and have to think hard about them. Finally, just a note on taxes, speaking of which, remember if you do your taxes, you can get help. There is a free tax clinic. There is a taxpayer advocate. If you need those people, contact me, 454-1070. 454-1070. Call me up, and I'll get them, get you to them. Also, there is a child, there's a child credit, child tax credit. You won't if you don't apply for it. And there's an earned income tax credit. People tend to forget that. Don't, don't forget that. Um, if you want to talk further about the housing issue, we could go on forever. Or if you want to talk about the 
talk about public safety or the environment, come find me and I'll talk to you. That's it. Thank you very much. Is there one or two questions somebody wants to pose? Yeah. Okay, Mary Alice, and then we'll move back to our agenda. As some of you know, I'm a current student at Harvard Divinity School working on some root causes for public life in Vermont as correlated with people's religious, spiritual, ethical views. One of my main takeaways from the last 10 years of researching is that one of the biggest reasons why we can't solve a lot of our financial crises here in Vermont is because we're not welcoming in new people. So another way of addressing the issues that we're having is back to the housing crisis. To consider looking inside of ourselves and being more self-reflective about what we were given when we moved here to this place by others and considering whether or not that's a gift that can be given to others and passed along. And one of the big root issues that I'm very concerned about in the legislature is the pay that's being paid to those individuals who are serving in the legislature. Because many people of my generation are willing to serve, they want to serve, they grew up in Vermont, people like Dylan Teach Out Burns and others. They've had top jobs at places around the country and the world. They are qualified, they have great values, they want to move back to Vermont and do this hard work. And they know how to do it while protecting the landscape, protecting our values. And I just want to say out loud that I think it's critical that we raise the pay for the members of the legislature. So it's not only a certain class of people, like yourself, um, Mark, and I'm not saying this in any way to um, undermine the value of your service, but right now, if you can hop on an airplane and fly around the country for a vacation, you are a very specific type of person who can afford to volunteer in the legislature. That is not the kind of legislature that can solve and resolve our crises. And I want to thank Ann Winchester for the fact that she's come into the select board and mentored younger people. I think the way that she's mentored this group of new folks in the select board is an incredible example of the way we can transition this state in public life but we can't wait until an entire generation dies and then have younger folks come in to serve and expect that they're gonna do a good job. So passing the baton has to be gradual and we have to respect and value the fact that the people in the legislature have to be paid to do this work. Very quickly, um, I emphatically agree, and not because I need the money. I mean, I'm retired, so I'm living off my retirement account. Um, there is a bill, there was a bill in the legislature to raise legislative pay. In my mind, I don't think it would have much effect. It, it really wouldn't encourage the young people that Mary Alice is talking about, because it wasn't enough. But what it did do, which is really important, is provide health care benefits. I think one of the reasons that young people can't afford to do it is that unless you've got someone else in the family who's got health care, you can't afford to serve. So I agree. I will say one of the reasons I've been feeling surprisingly happy and good about serving is because there are so many wonderful people in the legislature. My class, my entering class, was 50 out of 150. And a lot of them are really young. Really, I mean, like, one of our best legislators is 26 years old, and she's great. So there are young people serving, but there would be a lot more people serving, and people from diverse economic backgrounds, if there was at least health care, if not more pay. So Mary Alice, thank you, I agree. Okay, we're going to move on to our agenda. And the next four articles are about how we pay taxes. Um, Article 10, shall the voters authorize the payment of property taxes in two equal installments with the first installment due on or before 4 p.m. on a date that falls not less than 30 days 
after the tax bills are mailed, but not earlier than September 1, 2024, and the second installment due on or before 4 p.m. on Monday, November 15, 2024. Would somebody like to move this article? And has moved it. Do we have a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. We're open for discussion. Yes, Jan. I wonder if there's ever been a consideration for quarterly payments. And the reason why I'm asking, when we first moved into Vermont and lived in Underhill, and we were young, and we didn't have a lot of money sitting around, and it was wonderful to have a quarterly payment system. And I, I don't know why, what the interest is. I mean, I don't know. I just wondered if you had ever considered it, and if you haven't, would you please consider it next year? This select board certainly has not considered it, and I assume it would be um, an extra burden for the staff. So we would have to look into that. Um, but sure, we'll, we'll think about it. Thank you, Jan. Any further discussion of this article? David. The other form of payment that the town hasn't allowed yet is AH right to direct withdrawal from your checking account. I recommend that the select board look at that. The town Marshfield does do that. Okay, any other good ideas before we vote? <laughs> any other discussion? If not, uh, the article asks to authorize payment of property taxes in two equal installments with the first installment due on or before 4 p.m. on a date that falls not less than 30 days after the tax bills are mailed, but not earlier than September 1, 2024, and the second installment due on or before 4 p.m. on Monday, November 15, 2024. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you've passed Article 10. Article 11, shall each property tax installment payment be made via one of the following options? By delivery to the treasurer by 4 p.m. on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 10 by U.S. Postal Service with postmark on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 10, or three, by credit card payment via www.calisvermont.gov by 4 p.m. on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 10. Would somebody move this article? And has moved it. Do we have a second? It's been seconded. Discussion? Yes. I'm Donna Smyers from Adamant, and um, there's been a lot of questions about credit card payments versus debit payments at our store, and credit card payments have a, about a 3% um, fee associated with it, so that people who pay by check are actually um, not getting cash back from their credit card that the other people are. And I was just wondering whether we've ever considered if you do have a like a sort of cash discount versus credit card payment because it does cost the town more when you use a credit card. We have been talking about other ways people could pay. Um, we've been looking into it's called an automated, automated clearinghouse for bank accounts. And that will be discussed in the coming year. Thank you. Okay, we have a hand up here and then one in the back. And I'm a little unclear. Does someone who pays by credit card uh, pay a fee additional to the amount? Bobby, were you wanting to speak to that? Could I defer to Bobby? Thank you. I'm Barbara Butler. I'm the assistant town clerk. I live in beautiful North Callis. 
Um, the t it doesn't cost the town any additional funds for people to pay by credit card. Uh, the individual taxpayer pays that 3%, well, it may not be 3%. When you go to the website, right there it tells you that you will pay the credit card processing fee, and it tells you how much it's going to be for you. So the town actually does not incur that cost. Okay, further discussion of this article. Okay, so no hands. Um, this article asks, shall each property tax installment payment be made via one of the following options by delivery to the treasurer by 4 p.m. on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 10 by U.S. Postal Service with postmark on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 10 or by credit card payment via www.callisvermont.gov by 4 p.m. on or before the due dates as set forth in Article 10. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? And we've passed Article 11. Article 12, shall interest in the amount of a half percent per month or any part of a month be charged on unpaid taxes? Would somebody like to move this article? Thank you, Ann. Do we have a second? And it's been seconded. We're open for discussion. Barry? I'm going to comment on both this and the, the next one because they kind of go together. It seems to me that six percent, which would or three, you know, half a percent, is is not unreasonable, but the eight percent flat fee seems to, when you add it up, to be quite a bit. With people already having trouble paying the taxes, I don't I don't have a solution, and I know that the uh, the tax collector, uh, I believe, uh, is paid through the eight percent, but it just it seems. The combination seems to to me. So if somebody wanted to comment, it's actually more involved. I'll take it, and I guess Kari can correct me if I'm mischaracterizing it, but we took a pretty close look at that and had a, a lengthy discussion, or a mindful discussion of it. Uh, we were kind of aware of the challenges uh, of, of paying taxes and, and careful not to um, put a fee out there that seemed too punitive, um, but it was brought to our attention that uh, we're not even collecting enough to cover uh, the cost of our delinquent tax collector. Um, so uh, there are other uh, communities that do have a much higher and more punitive rate than, uh, than that 8%. Um, but we felt like it was fiscally responsible to at least cover our costs for having a delinquent tax collector. Uh, is that about right? So that's, that's where we landed on that. And there's a hand over there. Hi, uh, it's Michael Angel. I was going to ask about the 8% also. The first question is, why don't we hold, do one article at a time, get through this one, and Hold that question for the next one, if that's okay. I'll call on you right away when we get there. Is there anything more on this article? Okay, so the article is, Article 12, shall interest in the amount of a half percent per month or any part of a month be charged on unpaid taxes? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, and we've passed Article 12, so Article 13, shall a delinquent tax penalty be set at 8% of the total amount of the 2024 delinquent tax? Would somebody move this article? And has moved it, do we have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded, and now you have the floor. Okay, a couple questions, or maybe one question and one observation. Um, if you had to borrow money in lieu of taxes, what, what would you pay right now for interest? With currently, I mean, I, I know the rate, rates are up, but what I'm sure towns do a deal because they offer they borrow a lot. Um, well, it depends on what the source is. We have a line of credit that's 3.9% uh, is okay. what's available to us currently. So, what I'm seeing here 8% uh, is not what the town loses uh, uh, if they have to taxes, and I'm assuming the delinquent taxes are not that extreme. Uh, also, as far as the tax collector goes, for example, in Tanya Hydro, the town manager is a tax collector. Um, 
you know, and basically that's part of his job, part of the salary. We don't need to have a separate tax collector. We could have the, the town administrator do it, save some money. So I would move that we uh, lower the penalty to uh, 4%. And that, that way it's not punitive. The town is town really is money is because it isn't structured properly on how they're operating the tax collector. And that way we're not punishing people because they can't pay the taxes. They're already paying you know, 6% interest anyway. Anyway, that's my motion. Okay, the article is, there's a motion to amend the article to reduce the rate to 4%. We have a second, we have a second. We're open for discussion on that. Yes, hand up over here. Uh, Jack Russell. Mike, I'd like to hear from the, maybe the tax collector. I mean, how much of a problem, I mean, what are we dealing with? I mean, we're, we're making a decision without knowing the information. So, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm not the tax collector. Sandra Ferber is our delinquent tax collector and intends to stay on in that role. Just to speak to your point, that that is a role that's defined by statute and, and I believe is just required of us. It often goes, is combined with the treasurer, but it is a separate uh, function for the town. Also, it, I think it used to be the case that the delinquent tax collector would be paid out of the proceeds that they, they gathered. That's not the case anymore. Um, but I was going to say to the point that Jordan made, we are not covering the expense of, um, of our delinquent tax collection through, um, um, through the proceeds at 3%. <clears throat> and specifically in 2023, 20, we had 216,000 approximately in delinquent taxes. Uh, and uh, the, we paid our delinquent tax collector 11,000. So we were coming in well below that, over 4,000 short. So in a sense, we've been subsidizing delinquent tax collection um, you know, um, as a town. Uh, at 8%, we would be gathering uh, 17,000. That would be more than enough to, to cover the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, wage that's provided to the delinquent tax collector plus benefits, uh, um, payroll taxes, and all that. The other uh, point that Jordan also made is that we're not in line with the towns around us. We did a survey of surrounding towns. Worcester, Marshfield, Plainfield, Cabot, and East Montpelier, they're all at 8%. Uh, plus a 1% um, 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 interest rate. Berry City starts at 3% for the first month, then goes to 8% after one month. And Woodbury seems to be the outlier. They're at half a percent for the first month, and each month it goes up a half percent, which seems unnecessarily complicated to me. But that, so that, that's where the, you know, the surrounding towns are. The third factor that was discussed when, when this came up was that 3% uh, may not be sufficiently motiv motivating because of the sort of the market rates out there. So 3% um, essentially um, can be treated as almost a low interest loan as that the town is making. So it's certainly well below credit card um, rates at this point. And then just last to point out that the, um, I know Sandra takes this very seriously to work out payment plans and be as, as accommodating as possible when there is hardship and people in need time to make payments. And, and of course, as a last re resort, we have uh, abatement, which the reasons for abatement and basically lowering of taxes are, are set out in statutes and we have a process for that. We have a hand up back here. Please wait for the microphone. But, um, so you're, we're looking at a um, increase. What is it now? What is the percentage now? I, I don't remember. Currently it's at 3%. It's my, at 3%. my understanding is that this has fluctuated quite a bit over the years. Right. It has been at 8 and it's, it's currently at 3. So 3 to 8. And the proposal put forth sounded like that was a 4%. That's correct. Uh, that's the amendment that we're being asked to consider now. Okay. Any further discussion? Yes. Has the amount of delinquency shifted in relation to what the the tax penalty is, or do they seem to not really be correlated? Yeah, 
has the, del has the amount that we have in delinquent taxes, is it in some way correlated? So the years that we've been at 3%, does it seem to go up how much delinquency? And the years that we're more like at 8%, yeah. does it go down? I, I haven't that? looked at that. I don't know what the long term trends are. That's a really good Thank question. Thank you. We have a hand up in the back, and then we'll come over this way. Hi, Ryan Stern. Can you just give us a definition of what a delinquent tax is compared to the unpaid or late tax? They're the same. Delinquent it means late. Yes. So now, Barbara? Barbara, do you want to yeah. get your microphone? Okay. Now wait for the microphone, please. I promise all day long people have been saying they can't hear without the microphone. Okay, thank you. There is a difference between a late payment and a delinquent payment. Your, if you do not pay your September installment on time, that's late. That's what gets 1.5% interest per month on the unpaid balance. You're not delinquent until the second installment due November 15th. That's when it becomes delinquent. Any unpaid balance from either installment, the first one or the second one, any unpaid balance on your total tax bill is delinquent after, if it's not paid in full at the November 15th uh, installment date. And that's when the, the penalty that you're, uh, that's up for discussion now gets assessed in addition to the one and a half percent per month. Okay, there was a hand up on this side, but I, yep. Um, yes, I mean, it was very interesting. We had some people really talking about taking care of people in our town. This sounds like this is something that we can look at, whether it's 4% or 5%, and maybe not 8%. And then Tobin actually said, well, why don't you look at raising the price for people who have come in and, and don't live here full time. So I mean, I think that this is something really serious. This is a way that we can take care of people who are here. So that's all I just wanted to say. I'm for um, lowering the 8% and I don't know what percent, but to lower it. Okay, the amendment is to lower the amount from eight to four. Are you ready for that question? All those in fit? Yes, Michael, you want to speak? And let's get back in the habit of identifying ourselves. Michael Woodfield, I live on the county road in the Maple Corner area. Um, my question is, do we know how much revenue this raises? I mean, it has raised historically, because I, I, I don't know that, and that's an interesting point. Yeah, I quoted the 23 um, rate. We had, we had 216,000 and change in delinquent taxes, which brought in about $6,500 in penalties at the 3% rate. And we paid our delinquent tax collector $11,000. Okay, we have a hand up on this side. Um, I, I'm Donna Myers. I, um, have a comment on when you decrease the rate, it is not always the people who need it who take advantage of it. And I think the abatement program is appropriate for people who need tax relief. Um, and if you allow people who are good with money to get away with paying less, they tend to be the ones who take advantage of it and I think it's more appropriate to have a fairly aggressive tax abatement allowance for people who are in need rather than allowing people who actually have the money. Um, I can think of some politicians with lots of money who will not pay <laughs> unless they absolutely have to. And, and I don't think that the, you know, the billionaires who can make 5% should keep their money I mean, not that we have them here, but I just, I think that we should pay as we can and, and, and encourage people to pay on time. Okay, we have a hand in the middle. Uh, my name is Jonathan Hertz. Just a very quick question. The uh, 
the proposals mentioned a half a percent per month, and Barbara, you mentioned one and a half percent. Can you just clarify that for us? I misspoke. You are correct. Sorry. Okay. I misspoke. It is half a percent. Of, uh, one half of one percent. Thank you. Okay, so the question before you is whether to amend the article to reduce the delinquent tax penalty from 8 to 4%. Are you ready for that question? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. Nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it, and the amendment is defeated. We're back to the main question which is whether or not a delinquent tax penalty should be set at 8% total amount of the 2024 delinquent taxes. Are you ready for that question? Oh, we have a hand up in the middle. About 30 years ago, I got that 8% penalty, even though I had stuck my payment in the mail, but the mail got lost. I've never forgotten that penalty. I've never been late since. So it works. <laughs> Okay, all those in favor, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just wondering if there's a way to parse that this distinction, who is sitting on the egg, not, who's, who's not paying and, and until they can pay in full, and is there a way to, to understand what those populations are? You know, who, who, we're a small town, are people not paying who can pay? What's happening? Like, who, who, who are we talking about? <laughs> okay. Um, so when we were reviewing this and talking about this, uh, for folks that have challenges in paying their property tax, I would have historically at times been one of those people. Sandra works with folks um, that are proactive. There's also the abatement program. The eight percent is to address folks that have means, largely. Um, and choose because it's better for them to hold on to their money until they have to relinquish it than uh, to pay on time, which then sets the town back if we're not in getting in our revenue when we should be getting in our revenue. So I think largely the 8% is, is based on the fact that most of those folks are folks that are of means and have the capacity to pay and are choosing to push it off. And then that the folks that are struggling financially are Sandra works with those folks and as Donna had stated, we have abatement and other programs that kind of help. I mean, it's not a, it's not perfect. Certainly some people that are struggling to pay are probably gonna get caught in that 8%, um, but it's largely to encourage people that have capacity to pay and are choosing not to. You have a hand up in the front. Cynthia Gardner-Mars. Um, historically, we used to publish a list of people who are delinquent in their taxes to embarrass people into paying them. We don't do that anymore, but I think there's enough discussion here that we should form a committee to figure out what Calis should do about their taxes. And I offer to be on that committee, but I don't want to do it alone. And we have a hand up in the middle in the back. Um, is it true that Calis is second to Stowe for the highest taxes in Vermont? I just want to know the answer to that. that. That's what I've understood. I was a little shocked, but. I don't think anybody, I'm looking at, I don't think anybody knows the answer to your question. Cynthia, join the committee. We can find out. <laughs> <laughs> I need help sometimes, you know, so I'm yeah. just, I just, a lot of people do. Are you ready for the question? And the question is, what, Barbara? I'm Barbara Butler. I also want to remind you that even though we have two equal installments due September and November, that you're not limited to paying your tax burden at that time. That can be a lot of money for different households to have to come up with that two months apart. 
So I just want to remind you that if, you, if it works better for you to please remember you can do household budgeting and you can make monthly or quarterly payments toward the tax bill that's going to be coming to you later in the year and we will credit your tax bill so that when those installments come around in September and November, you've already been paying 50, 100, $250 a month toward it so that you're not having to come up with the whole burden within two months of each other. So we encourage you to think about a household budgeting. Yep. Yep. Okay, we've just had a motion to call the question. Uh, that's not debatable. All in favor of ending debate, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, the question's been called. So the question is, shall a delinquent tax penalty be set at 8% of the total amount of the 2024 delinquent tax? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and we've passed Article 13. Now we've got a bunch of emergency service articles. It's noontime. I'm sure some people are getting hungry. And there is a lunch to remind you about. So let's see how we can move along or not. That's up to you. Article 14, shall the voters appropriate $69,987 to fund the operating expenses of the East Montpelier Fire Department to be paid in quarterly installments starting July 1, 2024? Would someone like to move that article? So moved. Been moved, we have a second. We moved and seconded. Discussion? Andrew. Hi, this is our Andrew Neverby. I just had a question. Why are there two East Montpelier budget articles? Uh, I don't understand why that is split up into two parts. I believe the second one is for the ambulance service. Is there discussion of this article? Yes, in the middle. Just wondering about the discrepancy or the, the why the East Mont I should know this, but why is the East Montpelier number so vastly bigger than the Woodbury number? Somebody from the select board want to address that? Uh, James Daly, Woodbury Fire Department. I'm the president of the agency, and I believe we have two representatives from East Montpelier as well. Uh, the difference is, is that Woodbury does not have an ambulance service. Uh, that's your big ensuing cost. Uh, we do offer medical services. We have a fast squad. So we have a group of nine individuals who are EMRs and EMTs who come to your house and help do medical services with the ambulance to hopefully get you on their truck sooner and get you going to the hospital. That's the big difference. Further discussion, yes. Hi, Pam DeAndrea. I'm just curious, um, can someone speak to why the operating expenses of the East Montpelier um, Ambulance, and I guess fire department, went up so much? I'm curious about it. Largely cost of everything, um, but also with the, the rest user on East Montpelier hires uh, for the ambulances, the paramedics are people that um, are per diem, and so they're coming in after their, their regular jobs, like they're, they're folks that aren't getting benefits, but there is a, a substantial amount of overtime. Um, and there's been an increase in need for them to be going out, which is also, yeah, increasing costs. I don't know if one of the folks, oh, that's so Albert would probably like to speak to it better than I can. Well, it's like uh, everyone else, uh, everything is going up around us, and we're not immune from those expenses. Um, and salary, we try and raise it, but truthfully, we struggle to compete with some other entry-level positions and other occupations. And, you know, we don't get the money that we really need to operate from the communities. And so it's a challenge. We're, we're scraping bottom of the barrel, even though it sounds like a lot of money you're giving us, but it does not cover the expenses and give us a lot of what we call ability to improve certain things. 
We're struggling to upgrade computer systems, different things like that, because those are where we feel like we can put it off, put it off. But eventually, you know, the computer doesn't run anymore, and what do we do? And then that becomes a hit on a budget that's already lean. We're not asking for 100,000, knowing we need 50, and then say, well, compromise at 75, and then we got 25 to play with. You know, we feel like we ask for 80, we need 79.9 to make it work. Um, there is ways to save a little bit here and there, and we can do that. But expenses go up, we're developing a budget that's forecasting a year out, and we don't know what fuel oil is going to do in six months to a year, and we try and have that flexibility to cover the essentials. But we can't save money like other, you know, I'm not to pick on Kellogg Hubbard Library or any other agency. They can cut back an hour of operation and then they can save some money. They can cut back and say we're not going to be open on Saturdays anymore because the money we need to stay open seven days a week, we're not getting it, so we'll just do it five days a week, four days a week. Look at the Times Argus. It used to be a seven day a week paper. Now it's five days a week. But the fire department and ambulance service, they show up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter what the conditions are. If you knew what we had to go through to get the calls during the flood, driving out to Marshfield, to double back up some back road to get to some other place, to cross the road to get to Callis, it, it was amazing what we accomplished. And I don't think we're asking for too much. And I understand when you look at the total tax bill, it's a lot of money, but look at driving your car. Do the math. Figure out what it costs a day to run your car and compare it to the ambulance and fire service. It's, it's a, we're a lot cheaper, even though it adds up to be a lot at the end of the year. So I, I don't know how to answer your question. Just we operate bare bones. We really do. We want the budget to go through. Yep. Al, this is for you. Al, Al and James, when we were working on this budget with you folks, um, you mentioned several things that were increasing your budget, and I wonder if you could speak to it. You talked, for example, about changing regulations and how you now have to have certified people and how you have to pay these people more than you've had to in the past. You talked about how the cases that you've been getting have been more um, complicated than they've been in the past. Could, could you perhaps address that a little bit to help folks understand why these costs are going up? I, right now, I don't have notes to pull from the pull on specific. But the training requirements do go up. The key, the problem is, is keeping our people working for us. When they can go to the hospital and get a job for $28 an hour, and I, the most I can pay a paramedic level skill is $21 and change an hour. And we can't compete with what's around us. Most of our workers have left us to go to urgent care, to go to the hospital. And we're struggling to keep trained people on staff. Most of us do it because it's a passion. I respond with the ambulance. I don't ask to get reimbursed. I donate my time, everything I do. The hours that I spend training, going to meetings, showing up here and there and everywhere, I do not bill for my time. I get a stipend. It's $500 a year to be the fire chief. And that's all I get for that. But the call volumes are getting more. We're dealing with more drug-related, issues with overdoses, and it takes a, a wear and tear on your mental um, abilities. When you come to these calls and you just see death, more death than you should. And it's nothing we can control, unfortunately. You know, I don't know how we address those issues. But I can't singly say that there's one thing that's made our budget go up. We're just trying to 
stay ahead of the curve and not fall behind. Okay, over here. Hi, Rachel Seeley. Um, I support the request that you have for responsibility, or I will absolutely be voting yes. I did notice that Woodbury was able to provide us with the calls breakdown between Woodbury and Callis, and it would be really helpful, I think, in the future to have that information, because I think those numbers really help tell the story of how much work the Montpelier Fire Department does for us here at Callis. So just a suggestion for the future. Further just guess you can have four. Hi, uh, Nick Ward, Robinson Hill Road. Um, the, uh, the services that are provided are quite extraordinary, and I realize that it's a variable cost service. You can't predict exactly. It's not a fixed cost. And as I look around this room, I think the uh, demand for those services is not likely to go down. Um, I, I know that I, for one, would be pushing up daisies right now had they not made it to my house this time last year and had the technology that was required to communicate with Burlington and, and, uh, and CBH and take care of me. Um, that's expensive. Like Ann, I grew up in, I was a city boy, grew up in Montpelier, and we didn't, weren't half an hour from the hospital. Um, we could just get there. But here, and with our extended mud season that we seem to have, it's gonna take even longer. I just thank you for what you're doing, and I think the cost is, uh, something we're all going to be drawing on. Okay, so Article 14, if we're ready for the question, asks whether the voters will appropriate $69,987 to fund the operating expenses of the East Montpelier Fire Department to be paid in quarterly installments starting July 1, 2024. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Article 14 passes. Article 15 asks if the voters will appropriate $141,903 to fund the operating expenses of the East Montpelier Ambulance to be paid in quarterly installments starting July 1, 2024. Could somebody move this article? So moved. It moved. Do we have a second? Second. It moved and seconded. Discussion? Yes. I, I'm going to support this, but I just want to um, bring up for people who haven't been here. Um, when this was first pitched to us a long time ago, uh, when they were starting the ambulance service, it was going to be self-supporting. Um, I only bring that historically. It's that we have to determine whether this is the best way to provide ambulance service in, in the whole area or whether there should be some con consolidation. I have no idea what the answer is for that. I know we need the services, um, just a time to reflect on that. Thank you. I'm Rose Palachuk. Um, I have a long history with EMFD. My husband has been a member for more than 35 years. And I was the administrative assistant there for six years, specifically when the ambulance service started. I can tell you that the ambulance does bring in revenue, and um, the annual revenue is split um, into certain funds, and the majority of it goes into the capital reserve fund. So this annual appropriation goes to operating expenses for the ambulance service, um, but when it comes time to buy um, a new fire truck, a new ambulance, some um, capital equipment like the SCBA, the self-contained breathing apparatus, and um, other big expenses, that money, um, the fire department contributes directly from their capital reserve fund. So yes, there is revenue coming in, um, and it's all divvied up, and um, I think it's used wisely. I encourage everyone to support the work of EMFD and the Woodbury Fire Department. We need their services here in town. Thanks, Albert and Sandy. Thank 
further discussion? Yes. Uh, I just want to make one other comment that one of the things that's changed from then to now is truthfully the ability to volunteer. When this organization first put annual service together, it was a volunteer crew. And as Woodbury operates, 100% volunteer. Those volunteers slowly dried up. Now it's hard to get anybody to commit their free time to volunteer for services, no matter. And if you look at any, any group within this town that relies on volunteers, ask them if they're bursting at the seams and turning people away because they don't have to have too much help. They make do, and that's what we do. We run a per diem model. Yes, we pay hourly, but it's per diem. So basically, we fight for everybody's free time and pay them for that time. But it becomes a challenge because people have less and less free time. Even those that work can't or struggle to give free time because they want to be with their families. They want to do things outside of their career job. And so that becomes a challenge for us in the next couple of years of, and then, Taxes will go up some more because now salaries and benefits come into play. For me, it's staff and ambulance. Right now, we're lucky. We got people that can give us their free time. We'll pay them, but that in the next few years, I see is becoming more and more of a challenge because people cherish their time around families. All right, that's all. Okay, the question is, Article 15, whether the voters will appropriate $141,903 to fund the operating expenses of the East Montpelier Ambulance to be paid in quarterly installments starting July 1, 2024. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. And we're on to Article 16, which asks whether the voters will appropriate $17,850 to the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department to be added to the department's truck replacement fund to be paid July 1, 2024. Would somebody move this article? So moved. It's been moved. Do we have a second? It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Seeing no hands, all those in favor of appropriating $17,850 to the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department to be added to the department's Truck replacement fund to be paid July 1, 2024. Please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And we've passed that article. Article 17, shall the voters appropriate $77,895.27 to fund the operations of the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department, including $32,000 to be paid to the capital replacement fund by January 1, 2025, and $45,000 $895.27 to be paid in quarterly installments of $11,473.82 each to cover operating expenses starting July 1, 2024. Any discussion? Can we have that article moved? Okay, it's been moved. Do we have a second? It's been moved and seconded. Discussion? Okay, I think we're ready for this one too. So, shall the voters appropriate $77,895.27 for the Woodbury Volunteer Fire Department, including $32,000 to be paid to the Capital Reserve Fund by July 1, 2025, and $45,895.27 to be paid in quarterly installments to cover operating expenses starting July 1, 2024? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? We've covered Article 17. Article 18 asks, shall the voters authorize the select board to apply any highway department fund balance at the end of the fiscal year to the highway department capital equipment reserve fund and to do so each year until the voters vote otherwise? Would somebody move this article? And do we have a second again? Thank you both. Discussion? 
Yes, we have a hand in back. Hi, Brian Stern. I just have a question. Why it's set to continue until the voters vote otherwise as opposed to setting just some ridiculously high cap and then it would stop? <clears throat> so since I'm the newest of the community, I think, on the select board, I get to feign ignorance on the history of this article. Um, but uh, <clears throat> essentially, uh, we, we would vote every, uh, every year on, on how, to, uh, how to allocate any, any reserve funds and, and where it would go and what it could be used for, could be plowed back into the general fund. Uh, um, we, we thought it appropriate to have any reserve funds go into, uh, into the capital replacement fund um, so that that is funded uh, as, as efficiently as possible. Um, and not have to vote on it every year and, uh, and, and discuss uh, what, what to do with it or, or renew the article. Um, so that was uh, the impetus behind uh, the change in language here to kind of codify the intent of the original article when it was passed. Um, and why there isn't a, a, a dollar amount assigned to it is because none of us have a magic ball. Though I think, uh, as we discussed earlier today, um, uh, the reality is that we're we're going to be up against increased material costs. The the kind of habitual uh, reserve funds that that we would see building in in the road uh, budget are not likely going to be as significant. Um, so we will have to have conversation about this in the future. But it'd be nice to solidify this so that it's not up for debate quite so frequently. Okay, we have a hand up in the middle on this side. Yeah, Rick King Callis. I mean, just to address that a little bit, that reserve fund doesn't cover the cost of the equipment with retirements. Those are on regular retirement. We wear equipment out fast, and it's very, very expensive. You can get over $200,000 for a bond truck, you know, a third of a million per grader. And so what that ultimately does, and we account for that in our budgets here, if we, if we have an excess we accumulate there, it's less we bond for later. So it helps even the tax rates out. It's a good way to do that. There isn't a crystal ball, but I think this this makes a lot of fiscal sense for everybody in terms of predictability. Okay, are we ready for the question? Yes, we have one more hand here. I would like to make the motion that we strike the last line of that. I think it's worth having those conversations each year. Okay, we have an amendment to, to um, just stop at the end of capital reserve fund. You ready for that question? Do we have a second to this amendment? Motion's been made and seconded. Okay, so any further discussion? Okay, so the amendment says, shall the voters authorize the select board to apply any highway department fund balance at the end of the fiscal year to the highway department capital equipment reserve fund, period. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Nay. Nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. And we're back to the main question. And rather than reading it again, we'll just add and do the do so each year until the voters vote otherwise. So, are we ready for that question? Smack. I was wondering, what's the current balance in our capital reserve budget? I, I didn't see that in the budget. So and this is as of June 30th, 2023, we had 124,000. And I know that um, 
for the purchase of the mower um, in the fall, we allocated, I think, 35,000 from that. So we're, I think we're just below 100,000, above 90, but below 100. Yep, you can speak, and then Tina. Rose Kelcha. I just want to say basically what this means is we all know the highway budget is separate from the general government budget. At the end of the year, if there's funds unspent in the highway budget, it just goes into the savings account. That's what this is about. And then it basically will offset the cost of a new town truck or a new road grader or some other capital expense. So basically, it's moving it from your checking account to your savings account and it'll be there when you need it. So this is just a question because of the way the article is framed. Uh, I assume that the article to not fund or move funds to the, to the capital fund would have to be an article that would have to be warned so in other words, citizens would have to file a petition to get it on a town meeting agenda? I th I, Tina, I think the answer to that question is that could be the way, or if the fund got large enough, a bunch of people could go to the select board and ask them to change the practice. But yes, somebody would have to do something affirmatively. Thank you. I have another question or hand in the middle or thought. Yeah, Walter Obrzynski, Bliss Pond District. Uh, I'm just curious, I always wonder, you know, how much that amount is. I support it, it sounds uh, like fiscally the right thing to do, but we're talking about the Highway Equipment Fund, page 70, like every year we're gonna see how much that item is. And it's in the Highway Equipment Fund, correct? Yes, is what I'm seeing our town administrator say. Okay, thank you. Yes, Scott Passage. I'd like to move to call the question, and I'd also like to wait for lunch. <laughs> okay, the question's been called. All those in favor of ending debate, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so Article 18, shall the voters authorize the select board to apply any highway department fund balance at the end of the fiscal year to the highway department capital equipment reserve fund and to do so each year until the voters vote otherwise. Please, if you're in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it and you passed Article 18. We're up to the very last article that we discussed. There's been a request to recess for lunch. Uh, we could do that, or we can try to do any other business that might be to come before the meeting now. We don't need a motion to continue, I, I don't think. But if you're, I know that we have at least one article that we've heard about, or one item that has been on front porch forum. And I don't know if somebody's ready to speak to that. Okay, well, well let's get you a microphone then. Just raise your hand. Uh, this is a, a callous resolution. 
This is the callous resolution for a ceasefire in Palestine. I started out with this really brief, just a ceasefire, even though I wanted to add, you know, stop the arms, uh, uh, purchases, or <laughs> nerves. Anyways, um, I put it on Front Porch Forum, and um, I really had a lot of, a, a fair amount of people um, feel that it was inadequate, that it, they didn't say it that way, but they wanted a broader um, resolution, and I really agree with that. I just had been warned I need to keep it simple, and I know that. So this is as simple as I could get, and um, there are some copies of this, which I should give to whoever wants them. Um, here's Steve to help me. I don't need it this minute, but I need it. Ooh, okay. Well, you might need it pretty soon. And Gus, if you could give Gus one, too. Okay. So, um, the cap this is Callous Resolution for a Ceasefire in Palestine. These are my points. Citizens of Callous, Vermont, call... An immediate, an immediate, enduring ceasefire in Gaza and the West Bank. We condemn all attacks on civilians in Israel and Palestine and demand a release of hostages and detainees on both sides. We call for an end of arms sales to Israel in accordance to the Lehi Law Safeguard Act of 2020 which prohibits arms sales to countries committing genocide or war crimes. We ask that the billions of US dollars slated for Israel's war must now be used for massive humanitarian aid in Gaza. No humanitarian aid should be blocked. Reinstate UNRWA. We call, which is aid, aid to, to um, Palestine and has been blocked and, and not supported by our country recently. So we call for change in the United States policy with the Israeli government such that the genocide, occupation, and apartheid of Palestinians will end. And what's not on here is that I would like I don't know if it needs to be on here, but to send this to our select board, our legislature, our congressional delegates, the president, Kamala Harris, thank you for finally saying it, and um, Gus suggested maybe the UN. So um, yes, wherever, wherever we can send this. So, uh, to say that this this town voted for this, and um, I'd really like a hand count if that's not too laborious, um, because I, I'd like to know how many people have voted for this. And um, anyways, so does anyone that needs a copy of this not have one, or can you share them with each other? Um, so you're offering this as a motion, and now we need a second. Second. It's been moved, moved and seconded to adopt this resolution, which would then be recorded in the minutes. So is there further discussion? Or is there more, anything more you want to say, Cynthia, before that? No, there's so much more I would say, but I fear to found the, the best thing to put. And I appreciate, you know, I, I was ready with my pencil for all amendments, but uh, I love this town. Great town. Is there discussion? Yes. Um, thank you, Cynthia, for this, first of all. Um, Pam DeAndrea, Duke of Brook Road. I am among some of the mo more non-popular folks on this issue, but um, 
I would support this if, and I and I see that some things have been sprinkled in here where it's both sides, release of hostages and detainees on both sides. Um, I am against all the killing in the Middle East, um, Israeli and Palestinian. And I know that that was the original intent of this. Um, but I, I, I can't support this in the way that it's written. That's why I asked for a copy because I see detainees on both sides. This is really hard for me because there's hostages on one side and detainees on another side. And I think this issue is more complex than any of us in this room unless we've lived in Israel or Palestine can speak to. And I have family in Israel on, the day, on October 7th. This hit me harder than anything you can imagine. I didn't want to say anything today about this, but I, I just really, I live here in, on stolen land and I don't agree with the response. I'm not supportive of Netanyahu, but you know, if somebody came and kidnapped and raped my kid and um, took my husband and wouldn't let him back, and just so you all know, it was on the BBC this morning that Hamas is negotiating a ceasefire, but they're not, they're not willing to give a list of the hostages that they have nor will they release them all necessarily if there is a ceasefire. And I, I don't agree with what's going on by any means, as I'm sure nobody here does, but I am not in a position of a callous resident on stolen land to make this resolution and say that there are t detainees on both sides and to say that the detainees in Israel are not gonna wanna kill my family. So I, I have a problem with this, and I'm sorry. It, it just and in terms of the words apartheid, yes, the South African government has said that it's apartheid there. There's also security reasons for the blockades, and I, it, it's just this is not. I don't want my arms going to Israel necessarily, but I don't want my baby niece being putting her head chopped off. I'm sorry, I can't do this. Sorry. Is there further discussion? Yeah, there's a hand up over here. Les Birnbaum, um, Mate Corner. I wholeheartedly support the um, ceasefire part of this amendment, but I'm going to vote no because I disagree with the use of the term genocide. Yeah. Further discussion? Yeah. All right. Right behind you. Uh, my name is Art Edelstein. Um, uh, the way I look at this is, uh, I, agree, I agree, by the way, with uh, Mr. Bur Les, Les, about the term genocide. What I wanted to say was, uh, we've had barbarism on both sides. I don't understand why people think that when Hamas attacked Israel on the 7th, Israel was going to sit on its butt and do nothing. Um, it seems to me that uh, there was miscalculation on both sides. It's a rotten situation. Uh, I, I'm a little, I don't, I'm not sure that our town has any weight in this um, other than, you know, if every town in America did it, it still would not have much uh, impact, but what I heard from uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris the other day is, is the new, uh, executive branch's answer to what's going on, which is call a ceasefire. And uh, we now have to just wait on this because uh, they're working on it, but apparently it's going to be a slow process. So that's what I have to say. Hand in front. I, 
I support this motion, but I'm wondering, Cynthia, if you would uh, uh, take a friendly amendment with uh, condemning Hamas's attack on October 7th, because I think we can all agree that was pretty horrific. And um, we can debate about genocide or what, but there's obviously uh, heavy destruction in Palestine. And uh, unfortunately, there's too many men on both sides who deal with this, and a lot of people suffer. But if you would accept something like that, I don't know if it would please people, but I'm still going to support this. You can answer, and then we'll go over there. Okay, so um, I felt that I included that, um, and on the second point, we condemn all attacks on civilians in Israel and Palestine and demand a release of hostages and detainees on both sides. Now, I, I earlier did have Hamas, there's been about five drafts, which I just couldn't get to front porch for them. I've had several people, you know, respond. And I know this is a touchy subject, but I, I must say that the United Nations Inter International Court of Justice has said this is plausible genocide. And this is, I'm as upset with my own government. And this is not to, to put us at odds with each other. If you, if you want to, I asked um, the best I could over the internet if you have, uh, want to make a change, maybe you could have the language for it. And, and we could do that now. But, I felt that I included that because, it, and, and personally, it was a disproportionate, you know, 12 to 1,400 people killed. It's not right for anyone to be killed. It's a, it was a horrific massacre. But now, as of yesterday, it was 30,500 Palestinians killed and over 70,000 severely injured. Imagine children without eyes and limbs. And, 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 and look at the pictures. I look for, I don't look very much, but it's just devastating. And there's so many things that this, that this it's a very complicated situation. But I felt that I included that. Um, I, 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 if you want to reword that, but, but I think that it's fair to say we condemn all attacks on civilians in Israel and Palestine and demand a release of hostages and detainees on both sides. I mean, it's really broad in general, but I'm, I'm not anti-Semitic, and I don't think this is. Um, it, it was, and, and um, we, have an, we, we have a law which is being ignored in Washington, which is called the, the Leahy Law, the Safeguard Act of 2020. If you want to check that out, you'll see, I mean, this, this, this covers that and it's being ignored. We should not be selling arms to Israel. And it's nothing against the people of Israel. So, um, I, I just want to see if we can move this to a conclusion. I, I think you've stated your position, so you don't want to amend it further at this point. There are a couple other people who want to speak, and we do have a lunch that people work hard. I know, hard but we've spent a lot of time on a lot of things, and this yes. is always what happens. And, and, and I've spent a lot of time on this, and so have some other people care. So yeah, and I, I, I'm not, I, I just want to say, uh, this is not anything personal. To, I mean, it's personal, but it's, I've done my best. I've, there's been many people got in touch with me, and I've done the best I can to be inclusive with everybody. And um, 
I, so if anything's taken out of it, I, I'd like the words. To, I'd like to know. I don't want to take it out. That's what I said. Okay, thank you. Paul? Paul Hammond from South Dallas. Um, I've never quite been clear on the difference between a motion to pass over and a motion to table, but I would like to make whatever one is more appropriate in this instance. It's just too divisive for this otherwise really wonderful community. Uh, so, uh, parliamentarian, please let me know which one is right, but that would be my motion. Okay, I think it's a motion to table. They may be one and the same if I check the books. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded that we table this uh, resolution, which I believe is not debatable. Um, so I'm going to ask all in favor of tabling the resolution, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and the motion has been tabled. Is there any other business anybody would like to do? And Paul, it's probably the last time you'll be here as a resident from South Callis, but thank you for the many years of service you've given in the community. We'll miss you and Cornelia. Any other business to be done today? And we do have a lunch to get to. And we can come back if there's a whole lot. Hi, I'm working at the Rabies Shop Clinic on Saturday at the East Montpelier Fire Department from 9 a.m. to 12 noon to have your dogs and cats vaccinated. $20 per shot, and everyone needs to register their dogs here in Callis by April 1st, right, Tegan? Come to the Rabies Shop Clinic if your pet needs a shot. Thank you. Okay, I believe that by the motion of the people speak, a motion to close this meeting is in order. And if you have other business, post it on Front Porch Forum to make announcements to your neighbors. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Paul. And Okay. Any further discussion on adjourning and enjoying the Friends of Callis lunch? Please say aye. Aye. Opposed. We're done. Thank you all.